Good evening, everybody. And welcome to the College of Complexes. I'd like to, uh, again, welcome everybody to the College of Complexes tonight. My name is Tim. I will be taping this tonight. Brown will be taking over after he finishes collecting money from everybody. And you're in for a treat on Citizens United tonight. I uh, would like to just remind you briefly of uh, our format to all you newcomers. We'll have roughly 20 minutes of announcements. Then we'll have our speakers speak generally for about anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour. And then we'll have questions to the speaker. And at about 10 o'clock, we'll go into what we call our infamous rebuttal period, where you can speak on what the speaker spoke or anything else. Time to be allotted proportionally, usually about three to five minutes, or we have fewer, a little longer. I'd like to remind you of two rules about the college. Number one, no personal attacks. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. And number two, one rule at a time. The move to amend the Constitution to overturn Citizens United. Sharon Saunders, are you ready? Always ready as I'll ever be. All right. Hello, everybody. In the name of uh, doing something to overturn whatever this mess is that the, the uh, Supreme Court has given us, I am willing to take your abuse. Um, I am one of the, along with Phyllis Goldman, one of the people who has started the move to amend chapter, uh, and Max, Max will over here. And before I get into that, I really want to talk about myself. Um, and how, how many years, it's such a pleasure to get up here and talk about uh, what people have always told me to shut up about, which is my politics. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about how I got involved and how I got to move to amend. I have uh, eight grandkids who I'm fighting for tooth and nail for to take back this country. I'm determined to do it before I leave this earth. They are incredible kids. They're wonderful. They deserve better than we're giving them right now. I have been an activist as long as I can remember, and as long as I can remember, people have said to me, I don't want to hear all those things. I want to be happy. I don't want to think about that. And I think that's exactly what happened with, with Hitler. Uh, we don't. We want to pretend that these things do not exist. Well, they do, and it's getting worse every day. And I mean, literally every day. So my poor husband, who has been subjected to this, was sitting over there, keeps saying to me, "Enough politics." He's heard it now for 50 years. Here, 50 years, and he's heard this. But I've heard about the bulls and the bears. So it, it's just yes. this. Uh, it's Go the Cubs! Thing. I am part of the 10th congressional district, Democrats. I have helped to start Move to Amend. I helped to start Americans United for Separation of Church and State. I helped to start the Small Business Advocacy Council, which is uh, a new and growing organization which helps small businesses um, get on their feet. And I was in Springfield just a few weeks ago to see how that dysfunctional uh, group of people work down there. Um, I'm part of Citizens Action. I've been in Washington lobbying there on behalf of, uh, behalf of uh, Healthcare for America Now. Saw how those lobbyists control the, wall, the halls of Congress. Got to see how 30,000 people uh, rebelling against healthcare were never, never covered by the media. So I have been out here for all my life. I mean, you know, we're talking about a long time now, fighting for the rights of everybody. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I believe in social justice. I believe in you and I. I don't care what you are. We're all human beings. And I don't see the difference. I may not like certain people, like certain relatives, but the fact is we're all the same. And we're all equal, unless proven otherwise. Um, I have a son-in-law right now who's running for state's attorney of Lake County. And what he's trying to do is make the, the justice system there fair and equitable. It's been horrendous in Lake County. And he is one who can change it. So I'm very proud of everybody in my family, what they can do, and my grandkids. And so again, I am fighting for them. Um, I, I'm just going to give you a little history. I have been a political junkie since the time I was born. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know my cake tips, right? Okay. Um, oh, I get my three dollars back. Gotcha. Okay. When I was a kid, I'm leading up to move to a men, but I want to give you the story of, of how I got involved and how I'm fighting this battle, and then I'll tell you more about move to men as we get going. 
Uh, I remember coming home to school when I was in high school and watching the McCarthy hearings. I also remember being terrified of the Soviet Union and they were going to attack us at any moment, being in the 50s. And then I saw Joe McCarthy and I saw Cohn and I remember every day running home from school nobody else knew what I was doing and I'd sit there and watch as these people full of hatred, hatred for anybody who was different, who had a different belief, would do anything to get them out of the picture, be it the Rosenbergs who were communists, Whatever it was, they were willing, these people were willing to move you out of the picture. You didn't have a right as a writer in Hollywood to, to think differently. You had to be like them. And we sat there and watched, and thank goodness McCarthy didn't get as far as he wanted to. But then we went forward, and we went into the Nixon era. And I had came from a family that has, uh, my mother was a communist, socialist, as she'd say, but she was really a communist. My father was a right-wing Jew, and unheard of, unheard of in those days, and the battles, political battles, would go on nonstop. So I started out on the Nick help, believing my dad was right with Nixon, and I ended up believing my mother was somewhat right, and I moved over to the Kennedy era. I fought for Kennedy tooth and nail, and when he died, I mean, it was one of the saddest days of my life. But all along, I, I being a cynic, I didn't like the secret of things that were going on behind our back. We did not know what our government was doing. We did not know about the Iran Contra. We did not know. They were buying, the, the corporations were, were, were starting their control of this country. And Max would have to, Max Maxwell would have to help me with the details on the laws. But during all this, there was a move, and there's a continuous move, for corporate America and multinationals to take over this country. So with all these organizations, I get pushing and pushing and pushing, and, I, and a lot of people don't want to be pushed. They want to be happy. They want to forget it. So we moved forward, and I joined all these groups, and meanwhile I was watching Phyllis Shafley and the Eagle Forum and the KKK and, and um, uh, the John Burr Society, which of course we know is now a, a, you know, the, the family of the Koch brothers. Uh, and you know what they represent. They had all those Nazis in their family. And we're seeing all this move forward. And we're coming into a time where, I, I have a note here down, because I want to mention this, Carl Rowe, who to me should be sitting in prison, uh, defying, defying orders of the courts, he just walks away from it, who put uh, Governor uh, Don Sigelman in, in jail, who ruined other people's lives. We're watching this and watching it happen. The biggest problem to me, there are so many, the biggest problem is the media. I have been a protester for so many years, as Bob knows. I have been a protester. I have been out there. I have, people say, well, why aren't you doing something? And I say to them, but we do, and we're not covered. It's not, there is no media coverage. And why is there no media coverage? Oh, because the, corporate, the media is owned by the corporations. We cannot get through. I work for HCAN, uh, Healthcare for America now. We used to have protests in front of the Blue Cross Blue Shield groups and no coverage. We would, no, there was no way. We would have Univision or something like that. This is our biggest problem. And a couple of years ago, I traveled to Eastern Europe and I saw the remnants of what's left there, which is not that much better than it was before. And the first thing they would say, all these people who would, would take us on these tours, we lost the press. And that's what we have now. And if you watch John Stewart, you hear him, the, the buzzwords that are repeated on every single station, the same thing over and over again. So without a free press and without a media, our message does not get out. Um, I'm very, very frustrated you know, by that. So yes, uh, the left wing is not great, and the Democrats as a party are very, very weak. But the right wing fundamentalist is what is really killing me. We have the fundamentalist, the religious right, who wants to take over the schools, who wants to destroy the unions, who wants religion in in every facet of our of our country. And if you don't know this, when the Bush administration was in office, he put in Bush put in in every single office department of our of our government a religious office. And it has not been taken out. And that, in, in terms of separation of church and state, so that is still there. Now you have the charter schools coming in, who are really parochial schools. Are there two things? They're parochial schools, and the charter schools are really owned by people like the Koch brothers and the Murdochs, with a particular Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand agenda. And what happens? Those kids who don't get into the charter schools, the elite kids, 
they're dumped back into the public schools doubled up. So we're losing those kids. We don't have a public education system that's worth two cents. I was a special education teacher, and if it had not been for the unions, uh, the principals that were terrible would have never would, would have been able to fire anybody at all. Yeah. So yes, the unions yeah. are not perfect. They're not perfect. They are. But we need <laughs> we need some kind of balance. We need balance. And if you don't have balance, which we don't have now, then you have extremism. So whether it's the right or the left, you have extremism. Right now, it's not in our country. It's not the left. It's the right wing, and boy, do we have it. Uh, just a little aside, I was going out to my son-in-law uh, at the train stations to try to get votes for him on Friday, and I realized, why should I go there? I should go help Jan Schakowsky, who was going to be at the Mitt Romney breakfast out in Rosemont. And I went there, I got there early, and Jan is a, bit, a friend of mine, I love her, she represents, i got to tell you personally, everything that I feel, as does Bob. Bob, I know, in Rosemont, who feels the same way I do, that Jan is, if we had more Jans, we would be okay, we wouldn't have any problems. And Romney, who used to be a moderate, now if you've noticed, has come to the right wing, he's all the way on the other side, he doesn't want birth control, he doesn't want uh, women's rights of any kind, and what he is, the, he, the only station he allowed in there on uh, Friday morning was, was Fox. Yeah. So all the other ones were out there, and of course Jan and all, you know, got interviewed talking about Planned Parenthood and the Planned Parenthood person. I'm going back and forth in time, but what I'm saying is these people are so good at manipulating us. Uh, today I was in Lake Villa with my uh, son-in-law who was running for office, for state's attorney. The, everything is statutorum. They don't know why. What the, what the Republicans and the right wing and the corporations have done have taken these people's values and used them and abused these people and said, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna stick with you on that. But really what they're saying in their own their own words is corporations, we're gonna protect the rights of the corporations. Yeah. The multinationals, any corporations. So this is all what the reason I'm talking about this, this is all interconnected. It's all for the corporations. There is no other way to look at it. So if they, they want to get the right wing votes, what they'll do is they'll tell the people who don't know better, who don't know that they're losing their Social Security and their Medicare and their pensions, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> well, tell them what they want. Those who hate, you know, blacks because they're a different color, like President Obama, which is really what they are, is a bunch of racists. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Got some water in the room? Oh, 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 oh. This is what this is what's happening. You can see it out there in Lake Villa today. This is they don't know why they're voting for Rick. Thank you for Rick Centaur. They have no idea. They just know that it's lower taxes, and uh, or maybe they think they're lower taxes, and they're scared of anybody who's different. This is the main problem. So they'll get the votes. They, this is why they're voting. Or the values, what they call them, value voters. These are not value people. They they what they call themselves value voters. The fact that you don't want abortions does not make you a value voter. If, if you're a value voter, if you want don't want abortions and you're pro-life, but the day that child's born, you're willing to help that child get a, a decent life. That's what a value voter is to me. So I have been fighting this forever and, and watching, and, and we could take this thing round and round. I am getting to move to a men, but I do, I, I promise I am. Um, but then we don't have, not just fundamentalists, we have the neocons. It's a two-part, it's a two-part system here. The neocons, the neoconservatives, are the ones who are willing to uh, take over everybody else's natural resources for the sake of profit and the world and, the, and say, we, you know, we're going to take, we know what's best for the rest of you. And we're going to take over the mines and the oil fields, etc. That's the neocons. They're, they're intellectuals, not intellectuals, they're intelligent. They're well educated, and they know just what they're doing. So we have those two groups: we have the religious fundamentalists, and we have the neocons. And both of them, together, if you put them together, are extremely scary. And let me again mention that the Democrats are not much better. The reason being, except for people like Bernie Sanders or Jan Schakowsky or people like that, or uh, Grayson, who maybe Ryan was running again, even though he had an accident last week and hit somebody in the rear. Um, these people are, they are controlling our country. Now I'm going to take it even further. I'm going to talk about the, the, what my husband, poor husband here is um, during the NCAA time, but I'm, I'm indoctrinating him with, at all times with the politics. We have these multi, multinational corporations like an Apple, 
who is coming out with their perpetual copies of the iPad or whatever else. And meanwhile, they're taking all the jobs and putting them overseas at Foxconn, uh, where, where the workers are abused. Abused and abused, where they have a half a million people sitting in, um, well, I don't want to call it concentration camps, but they have little cities, and they're called on demand to do and uh, to make parts for Apple. Meanwhile, Apple's sitting on billions of dollars here. Do they have to do that? No. But that in the name of free, that's in the name of free trade. So not fair trade, and, and uh, not fair trade, and that's Cl uh, Clinton and uh, Phil Graham and those people who broke up the Steagall Glass Act. They don't care about fair trade, which means equality for the workers and some pensions and, and rights for them. That they're only talking about free trade, which means profits. In other words, they're buzzwords for profits for the for the CEOs. That disturbs me terribly that we keep having these CAFTA and NAFTA free trades. So that's all part of it. And I and I really feel that I need to talk about this when we get to move to amend, so we know that what we're doing in terms of moving to amend or anything else that we're doing in terms of corporations. Um, I, I, I just let me just look at my notes for one second. Um, I do want to talk about the regulatory agencies, too. Uh, I remember Robert Kennedy came out with a great book, which I can't remember the name of it, talking about every one of the regula regulatory agencies. And what he really said was that each one is owned or run by somebody from that corporation who wants to weaken it. And I think if I was to go piece by piece, the EPA, the FCC, the SEC, that's exactly what we have. We have weakened regulations. Um, which do not benefit us. And you can see that in your air, your air quality, your water quality, your food quality. We are not safe in terms of any of these things. So what we have to do in the mining as well, anything. They run these are the people who are running them really are the people who are in charge of that particular industry. So we take that and then we take all of what corporate America, who doesn't pay taxes, has done to us. And we're sitting here like a bunch of idiots taking it all. And I per personally believe we don't have to do that. And one of the reasons I helped start the chapter of Move to Amend was because I always feel that we at the grassroots <laughs> level must do something and must always do something because they're not going to do it for us. There is nobody who's going to do anything for us except ourselves. Yeah. I've got to tell you, that's the way it's going to be. So when I talk about, I want to just change the pages here for a second. Um, when I look at the entire corporate structure I, I, and you look at Wall Street, let me go back and talk just for a minute about OH. Um, being retired, uh, I do a lot of, I love to invest, and it's a very dangerous thing to do is invest. You're really risking. On the other hand, if you don't invest, then you don't go anywhere because there's no interest. So I watched the markets very, very carefully, and when it came to OA, I said to my husband, day in and day out, I drove him crazy, and I said, we're going to crash, we're going to crash, and he'd say, why don't you sell? So maybe we won't crash. <laughs> so I'd go in the back and forth, but if I do, and it comes back, whatever. It was inevitable. I, I don't want to blame just the Republicans. I think everybody was involved. It was inevitable because what was happening with the, the, the thirst for greed that these people have is that they were giving mortgages to people who had no business having mortgages, who could, find, who could get a mortgage based upon uh, no documentation, could make up any story. You can blame these people all you want. The fact is they allowed it. They allowed people to get mortgages with no documentation. The temptation is too great for people. They did it. Or the interest-only loan, so they could live in a house cheaply for five years. Well, what do you think? What was inevitable? Then they took all of these little things, and they packaged them together, and they sold them to, to Greece and to Italy and France and to you and me as prime uh, securities, prime investments. Well, of course. I mean, that was something ready to implode the entire world. It had to be because it was based upon derivatives and AIG and all these people with their false, you know, with the false profits. There was nothing there. It was all about air. So, of course, comes 208 and 209, and I'm watching all my investments go down the tube, uh, thousands a day or whatever, so I'm losing my retirement. Well, they turn around, of course, AIG and Goldman Sachs and all of them, and they say, well, you're at fault. You should have been, you know, you as the consumer should have been smart, and you should have not bought those products. It's not our fault. If we offer something like derivatives, and you're stupid enough to buy them, and we see that today with, with Goldman Sachs, 
Well, it's not my fault. I'm on, I'm in it for the profit. You're dumb. And, you know, that's your problem. So we saw what happened. Everything imploded and the country fell apart. And then you had all these people not working. And now that the job numbers are, have they lost their home. The logical thing to have done for most, in most cases was to re, uh, you know, to, to remod or to modify the mortgages. It would have been simple. Why, why hose those houses down, you know, to raise them down when you could have refinanced or you could have, you know, done something with the mortgages. But they chose not to. Uh, God forbid you should help a consumer. God forbid you should help a consumer. It's all about profits. When I helped start the Small Business Advocacy Council with Elliot Richardson, one of the things we did was say we have to get loans for small business, we have to get health care for small businesses in Springfield. We worked our tails off, and this group has gone from zero to, to, to 500 people in two years, and I'm very proud of it. And we're down there lobbying. But if we didn't do it, nobody else would do it for us. And we're fighting tooth and nail to get That's something for small business, because what else do you have? What else do you have? You don't, you can't rely on anybody else. So you have to take care of yourself, and you have to have start a small business. So we're doing that, and we're helping to call this uh, it's a seat program, self-employment assistance program. We're trying to help small businesses get started. They fight us. They fight us on on the exchange. They fight us on healthcare. They fight us on everything. The HMOs. They uh, with, when I worked for HK and Healthcare for America now. The profits are the only thing that matters. You and I do not matter. So what's happened, of course? We have nothing as a country. And the only way we can do it, we're, we're like a third world country. I, and I want to mention Amazon, who now has warehouses in this country that operate like the third world. So that's where we're at. We have people being abused because they're desperate for jobs. We have people who are homeless. We have the Occupy people who now are being yeah, uh, propagandized by the media as these horrendous people. I'm an Occupier. I'm down there with them. Maybe not in this weather until it got warm again, but I support them and I know them. And i got to tell you, these are phenomenal people. They are kids who have tuitions that are out of control. They have tuitions they can never pay back because the jobs they're getting are not sufficient enough to, to give them a salary that would help pay those loans back. We are charging them, we're, we are for, have for-profit universities that gouge these kids and take kids in for nothing, you know, for, for insane loans and they come out without any kind of skills and they're stuck. And this is what this, this government and this Supreme Court has done. Uh, and all they care about is profit. So the question is, uh, how much, what do we do about it? Well. I'm going to talk a little bit about Move to Amend. The reason I, Phyllis and I started Move to Amend, I think Move to Amend is one of the most uh, organized uh, groups that we have going. Um, and I like that part of it. I, I'm not a conformer, so I have trouble sticking with a group if I don't think it's perfect. But, uh, and there is no such thing. Move to Amend is, has, is very organized, and they are very convinced that the amendment's the way to go. Um, if you notice, there's an invitation. We're having Professor Jeffrey Stone talk to us at the Northbrook Library on April 5th. Uh, he is incredible. I mean, I hear he, and I haven't heard him, but everybody who has heard him said he's unbelievable. Jeffrey, Sachs or Jeffrey? Jeffrey Stone. Okay. He is a, a constitutional attorney at the University of Chicago, and he's going to be with us at the Northbrook Library on April 5th. He doesn't like the wording of this particular amendment, he wants it changed. So, this is what's going on right now, so you understand this. Move to Amend is one of many, many groups in a coalition that is growing by leaps and bounds, each with a different, different resolution, each with a different agenda. And what Move to Amend is doing, and we're saying, I know Max is, I think is with me on this, uh, and Phyllis, is that the wording right now is not the critical thing in terms of an amendment. It's not the most critical. We can play around with that. What is critical is that we inform the public as as to their involvement and what it means that they don't do something to overturn Citizens United. And overturning is only one thing. There are many people out there right now who believe that we have to have congressional uh, uh, acts. We have to do have the laws that are changed. We have to have um, uh, regulatory rules that were strengthened the FCC and say to the FCC, you have an obligation here to do more. <laughs> So that's, oh, so there's like three different ways to go. Now there's a new group called MOP, 
Um, forgot what it stands for. But what they're saying is we have to tax all this money coming in from the super PACs. That's one way to do it. If you're going to do business in our state, uh, that's doing business if you're going to start a super PAC for a candidate. We're going to tax you 100%. So we have all these ideas floating around right now. I am sticking with Move to Amend because I like the way it operates. Uh, uh, Max has set up a site for us, and I forgot, what's it called, Max? Um, Move to it's, it's not Move to Amend, it's MTA. Okay. So it's www.mta. Greater Chicago. Great. Greater Chicago. Yeah. Okay, so it's MTA GreaterChicago.com. Uh, Max has worked long and hard on this to get this set up. So I urge you all to go to that as well as the Move to Amend site. And what you find out is that you can sign all these petitions everywhere. It doesn't matter. None of them are binding. They're all non binding petitions at this point. Uh, the, the really interesting one thing we have going on is in Montana, you've heard about it, which is, is saying to the Supreme Court, their Supreme, state Supreme Court has said, we to the, to the U.S. Supreme Court, we don't agree with your decision. It's wrong. You have no business to rule on behalf of corporations and election laws. And the Supreme Court now is going to hear that, and uh, that's going to be very interesting to hear what they say. The other thing we're doing is non-binding resolutions. We're doing township resolutions. Uh, we're doing the non-binding type because they're easier to do. You only have to get a certain number of people to, uh, to sign and then you bring hordes of people into your township meeting. We're looking for city resolutions and we're trying to get the city of Chicago to, to sign on, which is going to be hard with Emmanuel, who is no Democrat in my opinion. Um, Thank you. You, the thing is, the thing is that we, most of it is education. It's educating a public that doesn't know what's happening. And that is intentional by the other side. And I'm going to say Democrats too. They don't want the public to know what's happening to them. They don't want them to know that they're losing their Medicare. They want to privatize their Medicare and their Social Security and everything else. They want to privatize it, just like your meters out here or your prisons or whatever, all for profit. They don't want you to know that. So our job in Move to Amend and the other groups is to inform. And to inform by, by saying, will you sign this petition and then read this information about why it's important because you will have nothing, and that's not a scare tactic. You will have nothing when the right wing gets up with you. They don't want you to have anything. That is their goal. They want an elite corporate at the top and they want everybody else poor and subservient like a third world country. That's where we're heading, and I am not just saying that. I have been following this for year after year, and this is exactly where we're going. And again, I'm going to say, the leftists, we have the communists, they're no better on that extreme. The right wing, the fascists, they're no better. I mean, it doesn't matter. Any kind of extreme is bad for all of us. And the only way we get out of all this is to fight for ourselves. Um, I, I want to make sure that I cover the points that I wanted. I'm never going to talk for an hour and all of that. But um, I do, I do want to say that we have to, because I go at a mile a minute, right? <laughs> um, we have to look at all of these things, and we really have to say what's going on here. And I doubt there's people in this room that would disagree with me on this. We have to look at. My husband and I just bought two, two uh, hybrids. So why isn't everybody driving a hybrid? Because they don't want you to drive a hybrid. They're not pushing it. They want to drill, and they want to just drill and drill. That's what they want is profits. They want fracking and drilling and, and going back in the Gulf of Mexico and destroying all the foods there and, and the food source and the food chain. They don't care. So, I, I mean, this is why, again, we have come back to move to amend. We have to do something. Um, there are, right now, there are five different amendments that have been proposed. Nobody agrees on the amendments to the Constitution. Uh, I could read them to you, but I don't know that. I think it probably would rather discuss things with you and they have to ask assault yeah, me verbally or something like that. Um, the media of all the problems we have right now, and of course as an as ex-public school teacher, a special ed teacher, this is my, my worry is that we do not have education from, uh, from kindergarten all the way through college that is, that is reasonable and good. Of course there are bad teachers. There's no doubt about that. Of course there are bad principals and there are bad union leaders. But again, it's the balance. If we don't have a balance, we have nothing. Uh, I want to do, as I go back and forth, and I apologize for that, my brain is all over the place. I do want to say that one of the things that, that is being said right now, and is being said a lot about oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Citizens United, is that, and I'm hoping this is a thing we might get them on, 
that legally they have no right as a Supreme Court to rule on citizens on the Gore Bush uh, issue and on Citizens United. Because it's very clear in the Constitution that the Supreme Court cannot rule on issues that are related to elections. And they got around that. If we had a Congress that had the guts, had the guts, and could put their money aside, then we could do something about it. So therefore, getting back to move to amend, but putting the pressure on our Congress people through move to amend, signing petitions, we can do it that way. We can put pressure on them that way. They didn't have the right to do it. And there, there's no agreement right now as whether or not we can totally overturn their decision or it's too late. Um, there are certainly conflicts of interest in the Supreme Court that legally go and, and have meetings and rendezvous and parties with, with people from the, uh, the various parties. Right in our face, they just, you know, laugh it off. We know that Clarence Thomas is uh, not our most uh, effective uh, Supreme Court justice. Uh, we know that his wife worked for the Heritage Foundation, made seven hundred thousand. He didn't report on, uh, but we're letting we're letting that go because we have a weak Congress. We have everybody is weak, and why are they weak? They're weak because they care about money more than anything else. So this group called MOB is uh, whatever it stands for. They would like what they would like is an amendment or some kind of decision where people run on one issue, and the only issue is you say to these people running. Will you vote to overturn Citizens United? Or will you take Citizens United out of the picture? <coughs> and will you vote, the issue is money and politics, will you vote to, to have public financing? That is their goal. Will that work? I don't know. But what I'm saying is that all of these things together are probably, uh, will put pressure on, if we sort of like put a vice on, on, the, on Congress, and the Supreme Court, and we get it out there through the viral, you know, the internet, it has a chance. We can't get through the mainstream media, but we can if we take all these groups and work as coalitions and say, we'll put aside all the things that we don't like or we, that we want to work on separately, because People for the American Way works on different things, uh, Citizens Action works on different things, uh, Free Press, they have their agenda. All these groups have different agendas, but if we take what the main thing we're all working for, which is to take our country back, I think we can do it, and I think we can do it by signing petitions, millions of them, letting our politicians know we're not going to take this crap anymore. We're tired of it. This is our country. We, the Constitution, was written for people, not corporations. And that's clearly there, even though it's been modified and they've tried over the years to, to take it for corporations and actually been quite successful. Um, I, I think though that we can make a change as a people if we get the word out. That's why I'm willing to be abused by all of you here, because I, I think this is the way to do it. Um, move to amend may not be the perfect solution, but with all of us doing it and getting signatures and getting involved and coming to meetings and doing all this stuff, that in itself I think will make a difference. And I, I know we can do it. I know we have to do it. There is really no choice. So that is basically what I have to say. Uh, join Move to Men. Come to our meetings. Uh, they're interesting. They're, they're fun. And I have to say that Max runs a great meeting because he taught us the consensus method uh, instead of me screaming and yelling all the time. So um, get involved. Sign the petition. Remembering that you can sign hundreds of petitions. It doesn't mean you can do for people for the American way, for Citizens United. I mean, that's it. Citizens Action, uh, Public Citizen. Public Citizen's a great group. Sign them all online. Don't worry about it. Your name is out there. My name is out there by millions of times already. Uh, they haven't come for me yet. <laughs> Even though every once in a while I wonder if somebody's behind me. But, um, you know, my answer when people say, well, I'm scared to get my name out there, I say to them, if you have to be scared that we're no better than, than, than the days of the Nazis or Eastern Europe, I'm not going to be scared. I mean, and that's what, and enough of us do it. You don't have to worry. I am out there in the front forefront all the day fighting. I don't care. Of course, I'm getting older. What difference to make? I guess if I was younger, it might make a difference. But um, I don't care. I'm going to fight for the freedom and democracy that we were given in that Constitution. And then the, the, the ten, 10 Amendments, the Bill of Rights, that's ours. It's not the corporation. So uh, with that, um, I, I really would probably like to resort to maybe questions or answers okay. or comments or, or whatever. I, I can't quote like Max can the the exact laws, because I don't have the memory for that, but I have the information, I just have to dig it out. That's so that's basically what I'm saying.
regards to the Supreme Court of Jurisdiction to, to uh, rule upon elections. Tell us where. Well, that's where I say I'm very weak. I've been reading it many, many times. No, I know. I know you're right. I knew it was a bit caught on this. I, I did read it again it's today. your source here. What? Is your source here? Your friend here. He can come up and help you answer. Yeah, I, I can't do it off. It, my memory is not paid. Okay. It, it my is. My memory is paid for. I do have it, and I will find it for you. I brought my stuff here. I will find it for you, and my uh, all my stuff I printed out. It is there. Declaration of um, I, and it, I think it's fairly clear, but I have to show it to you. Okay. I, I, yeah, of I will gladly do that. It's yes. So I have, um, no, I do you mention unions, for instance? Uh, under Roosevelt, we had something like 35 percent in unions, and now it's about eight. <coughs> if I go to Sweden, the reason they have a viable social democracy, 85 percent of their workers are in unions. That's why they're more successful. Of course, we can't compare the United States with, uh, with Sweden, but. Uh, Maybe you could talk about uh, uh, about you. Oh my God! I was, you know, first of all, um, when I was a kid, I, I, you know, my dad was a right winger. He didn't believe in them. And then when I became a teacher, I became very active in unions. And the reason being is that without them, we would have had nothing, absolutely nothing, as teachers. And I think we were fairly paid, not overly paid, like they're saying. We didn't make extraordinary amounts of money. We didn't care. We wanted fair pay. Plus, we had school boards to deal with who. We're there, we're school boards, we're there for many reasons, and not always good reasons. I am a big uh, a believer in unions, and I see the right wing is, is, is determined, like in Wisconsin, to get rid of them. Not just Wisconsin, everywhere. They want no part. They, in Citizens United, I mean, the unions have rights. Corporations and unions can, can have certain rights as regard, because of Citizens United. But the corporations know damn well that the unions are nowhere near as powerful. And what they're trying to do, actually, is to kill the unions off. They absolutely don't want them. I work with the SEIU and the UAW, all of these groups I work with, and Occupy works with them. And we all know that anybody who's dealing with that's the goal, is to stop any kind of union, because they don't want the employees to have any rights. And they will not have any rights. There will be sweatshops here unless we have unions. So that's what, you know, I didn't make, there's a lot of things I didn't say, but that was... I mean, I'm a strong believer. Again, and when I was a kid, unions were extreme the other way, you know, and they and they were extortionists and all that other stuff. So it was extreme. It's just, whenever you get into the extreme, then you have problems. But not the unions today. They're being totally demoralized. These SEIU workers that I I know, I mean, and, and there's thousands of them out there. I, well, let me give you an example of what Hyatt is doing. A Hyatt who has all these wonderful foundations, you know, to help people, blah, blah, and all that stuff. Meanwhile, while they're giving all these millions to all these wonderful causes and being written up in the paper, meanwhile, they will not give their workers, you know, a living wage, just a bare minimum wage. They're fighting it. That kills me. That's not fairness. We need unions. We must have them. And that's all I can tell you is that I certainly believe that there's a big, big, you know, place for unions. We can't, we can't survive without them. I was reading about how Greece uh, is has in, in being able to be uh, lend the money that not to go broke. They are forcing Greece to sell everything: the museums, the trains, the telephone. Just sell outright the whole country. Now, uh, don't you see that this this problem we have here, this corporation, have taken over the whole world? Absolutely. It's not only here. So how, how do we find that? Well, absolutely, and, and maybe the, you know, the... Can you repeat the question? Yeah, can you repeat the question? Because we can't hear any of yeah. that here. You want the question? No, no, you go ahead. You, you repeat it. Well, he's saying that in Greece, I mean, you know, the, the, they're selling off all the property there to help pay for their debt. And it's, it's forcing it's them. Forcing them to do that. And what do we do about it? Well, Greece and Italy and all these Portugal, they're all the same problem. We have sold them all this crap that put them in, I excuse my language, I'm sorry, uh, that have put them in a situation. But what, what's happening in Greece now, and all of them, is that the people who have taken over in power are the same elite that have taken over here. So these are the, the oligarchs that are taking over in Greece and Italy and France, all these places, which leaves the small guy nowhere at all. 
And what we can do about it, I guess, is these, these spring revol revolutions. Of course, the problem with all these revolutions everywhere in the Middle East and Europe, they have to have some focus, and it, to me, it should only be democracy, and we have to work towards that. So what can Greece do? Nothing. I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer on that. I really don't. But I know that the oligarchies are taking over the, the very super wealthy, and they could care less about the small guy. They don't need it. They don't care. Yeah. I'm not answering your question, but I don't know the answer. I think it's the same answer as here, though. No, it's same problem. No, just recognize that the problem is not only here. It's yeah. It's global. It, but I think that we caused it with the in 08, with all of these, uh, these what well, we sold them everywhere, is these horrendous instruments, of financial instruments. Yes, yes sir. Bob, oh. Okay, uh, I want to put all this, you know, you know, left right rhetoric aside here and focus on tonight's topic, which is about the Citizens United which is uh, a restriction, uh, but you're, what, you're, what you're advocating is a restriction on free speech. On what I can see in here, if somebody, whether it's a union, a corporation, or it could be a nonprofit, profit or profit corporation, or a union, cannot, well, used to be, could not publish a book or a film that had uh, information about a candidate 30 days before a primary or 60 days before a general election. Uh, that, you know, I'm glad the law's lifted, and I want to keep it lifted. I don't want to have my free speech restricted. Now, if Newt Gingrich spent a billion dollars, and they made great movies about him, would you vote for him if you saw a billion dollar movie about how great Newt Gingrich is? Yeah. I'm going to guess no. That's great. Right, if they right. spent 10 billion on a movie about Newt Gingrich, you still would not vote but for him. But she's well right. informed. Right. So, that's started. my point is, why do you small L liberals think that right. we can discern for ourselves what we He's see and read and make our own decisions, that we need you little L liberals to have big government look over us and say, oh, no, 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 you can't see that. You can't hear that or you can't read that. I want you small L liberals to get out of my bedroom and my <laughs> and my library he's, he's and my movie theater. Ridiculous. I'm out of your library. I think uh, first, first of all, I think that I think it's the right who comes in the library. I look at it. There's no yeah. that, that I'm, I'm progressive. I'm liberal, whatever. I think it's the right wing that is coming in and saying to the libraries, you can't have this book and that book and that book. I mean, it's, it's not the left that's saying that. Uh, I believe in free speech. I don't believe that corporations have the right to speech. Oh! I don't. I don't. I think that corporations are not people. And only people have the right to free speech. Next question. And sir, the issue of oh, no, free that. speech, the real issue is censorship. So if, if, a, if a private entity can go and, 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 and spend millions and millions and millions of dollars communicating their, you know, their message, that means that somebody else can't. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So it's, no, it's, it's not even an issue of free speech. It's Moderator, this is a question, question period. Do you have a question? Do you have a question? No I question. won't have one if you got half to Well, if you speak, will please ask your question. Okay. Next question, please. Okay. What she said? Charles, it up. Well, I thought Gene had a question. Yeah. No, he doesn't have All a right. question. All right. You want a, a legislative approach, like these Fabian socialists, that they could legislate socialism. Uh, I've been, the organized labor movement have been waiting about 200 years for adequate labor laws, and they haven't happened. Is this a realistic approach? I think I, what I'm saying, people have to get out on the streets peacefully. I'm not, I'm not advocating 
violence. I'm saying that's the only way. It's peace, peace, you know, people on the street like the Occupy movements, and and you have to be out there, you know, standing up for what you want. There is no other way to do it right now. You can't get you can't get through anything. There is no way to do it. You're going to get something through. One half of the Congress that I believe is, is Republican corporate. Or if you try the other approach, you've got a lot of states legislatures who are Tea Party crazies. Well, that's right. So that's, what do you do? You, you work at the state level, which we're doing right now. You're working there. You have to build momentum. It doesn't matter whether it's the state or the federal level. I've been in Washington. I've been to Springfield. I've lobbied both places. You have to pick out the ones, what you do, and the same thing for Move to Event, if you want to follow their model. You pick out people who are sympathetic with you, and then you talk to them and get their, their you know, okay on this, and then you say to them, who else can we talk to? And that's what exactly SBAC, the Small Business Group, is doing right now, and they're very good at that. They're taking allies, and they're building allies, and yes, we know right now we're divided along party lines. There is no other choice. And I've been around long enough to see this. There is no other choice but to organize at the at the grassroots level and get to Springfield, get to your city councils, and get to every place else. And to get it out on the viral internet, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is. This is the only way you can do it. I'm going to try this once again. Follow up. I do not no, answer I have one. All right. Yeah, that's constitutional. No. How do you go through a legislature if you've got it? If it's the Constitution. Okay, the kind of what right, they're right, saying right. about the kind of, uh, okay, okay, there's various things here. We're, they're saying there are people right now who are are trying to get laws passed on election reform. There are Congress people who yeah. are trying, like Bernie Sanders and whatever. They're doing it through amendments and they're doing it through laws. They're trying to get legislation. You know, it probably will go nowhere, but they're doing it. They're trying it, and again, it's getting sympathy from the people. And when, when Bernie Sanders goes on to Tom Hartman's show and talks about that, he's building his support. You build your bases. So, you know, that's all I can say from my knowledge, which is limited. As, as, a, okay, I'm sorry. as a follow up, haven't we seen this worker problem going on for some time? If you go back to even Henry Clay Frick and the Pinkertons and the Amalgamated Steel Workers Union, look what happened with the government response there. I don't see things really any different since that same time frame. What makes you think you're going to succeed this time? I didn't say I'm going to succeed. I said I'm going to try to succeed. And first of all, the big difference today and then is it's very similar. I'm not saying it's not. Okay. We're a much bigger country. Is that we are a global economy, and we can always say to our workers here, like we have been doing, how with you guys, we're going overseas. We'll make that jump over there. And that's where we have no jobs, no factory jobs. That's exactly it. The difference is where that is global. We can go for, we can go to Vietnam. We can go to all these places, and we can get workers for a few cents a day. Even Foxconn doesn't like the fact that the workers are rebelling, uh, rebelling against them. They're going to cheaper countries and cheaper countries, yeah. and the products you're getting are cheaper and cheaper. You go to a TJ Maxx or any of these stores now, who used to se used to sell you products that maybe were outdated but were good. Instead, they're making such garbage that you can't even use these products. Mm -hmm. So I think it's worse. I think it is worse. I think the quality, there's no quality of anything. And so I'm saying only the rich, the very rich, could afford to go to a coach and buy their purses and all that. This is, and they know this. If you buy all your stuff at Walmart, go ahead. You're not getting cheaper product. Cheaper for the same product. You're getting cheaper products. So, you know, that's where I think it's worse. Okay. Thanks. Bernie? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> a couple of questions. Do you think... Um, the prosecution of Rod Blagojevich was actually political persecution, and no. that uh, <laughs> our government may have made better use of its assets going after the Wall Street banks. Oh, okay, if you want to compare, first of all, we might have been talking. I think the sentence, and I happen to know the judge there, Jimmy Zagel, I can't believe that he gave 14 years, I think it's way too obscene, but I can't believe that he gave 14 years. I don't think that Wall Street has anything to do with it. I mean, you can't even connect them up. I think Eric Holder was wrong when he made a statement, and I read it in the New York Times, I think, that said, when he was interviewed and asked why he didn't go after the big guys, he said, well, I'm going after the medium, you know, the, the lower level ones, because it, I won't be, you know, it won't upset the apple cart. So he was really able, he was willing not to go after the Blankenbeins and all those guys up there because of too much trouble, or the Ferds, or Ferd, whatever his name is. 
because he didn't want to upset the apple cart. I mean, you know, and I, look at I was a big supporter of Obama, and yet I look at Larry Summers and got you know you put in the same people across the problem. So I don't think it's a, it's comparing apples and oranges. I think that Blagoj an awful lot of money went into Blagojevich and probably still will if there's a you know an appeal, but. I think his sentence was too long for what he did compared to the Wall Street people who should be sitting in jail. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. They, put in they destroyed the economy and they will continue to do it. Yeah. Rosenstiel and then Taggart. Oh, uh, sir, what progress have we made in the uh, move to that of getting through to the and Joe Moore who wants to introduce a uh, non-binding resolution of the city council? Well, well you know... Question? Uh, I want to know what progress we made in the to a man of getting through to all of the Joe Moore of the 49th Ward who wants to sponsor in the City Council of Chicago a non-binding resolution to annul the, uh, the issue we're talking about. Okay, so I know you've be been in contact with me a lot on that. What we did was Lyle, I forgot his last name, Phil. Hi. Hi. Uh, we're meeting with him and Ray Calderon, who's head of, uh, he was the executive director of, uh, of uh, Common Cause, Illinois. Uh, Ray knows all those people. We're meeting with him on the 28th, and he is going to work the Chicago thing. I'm, I'm doing the Northfield Township resolution. Bob, I know that you write that. I read everything you write, but I haven't had time to do it. I intend to get involved with that. It's a matter of, you know, I've got the election with Chris. But I think we're, we're going after a, a city of Chicago resolution. And the Chicago people are going to work on that because I don't live in Chicago. But Ray Calderon is phenomenal. Phyllis and I met with him. He is brilliant and he is helping us. He knows everybody in the state and the city. So we're going after that. And also the question is, there are, there are two different things here in terms of move to amend. Well, you can go for a township, you can go for a resolution at the township or the city level, which is non-binding. The big job and the thing we should be doing after we get a few of these resolutions is an actual binding uh, ballot initiative. And that takes, then you have to get 8% of the gubernatorial uh, electorate uh, in the last election to sign, and which is a lot of work. And we, we, we need to do all these things. We need it with help. That's why I'm here. I'm willing to risk my life here. Um, so that we can, we can get support to do, if you see this, if you see a request for a ballot initiative, we need everybody out working for it. Well, you put your life on the line, I'll be there to put my life on the line. I know you will, Bob. I yeah. know you're great, so, okay. Dave Zucker. Yes, I thought I heard you mention the Polk brothers before. Coke. Uh, Coke. Coke. I'm sorry, I was wrong. No, the Coke brothers, who are about as evil as anybody in this world. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, Bob. Yes. Uh, I'm Bob Hoffman. I'm the uh, what's the question? Hand in the microphone. Okay. Hand in the microphone. I don't think I know the answer. I recall there was a movement to overturn this notion that the Fourth Amendment says corporations are people. Which was only a footnote in the decision, it somehow got uh, written into a, a decision. And I think that happened before all this uh, Citizens United stuff. Plessy versus Ferguson. My reading says differently that there is that there was never any reference. But you know, it doesn't mean I'm right. I, I'm not. I'm you know. I'm not sure. Did you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, 1886, the decision Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. The issue came up. The clerk wrote in the order yeah. there that a corporation is a person. Yeah. This is not the judge's decision, just not what the court put in, because the corporations were trying to get this back then. That was accepted, and now they've just taken it one step further. Well, my original question is, what about Bogoyevich? Uh, you mentioned Don Siegelman. Carl Rove tried to set him up, tried to send a prostitute. You can't hear. Um, Give him the mic. We, give him the microphone. We can't hear anything gotcha. back there. Oh, okay. Sit up. Uh, I'm uh, Bogoyevich. Um, Don, Don Sigelman in Alabama was set up by Carl Rove. 
They got him convicted and sent to jail. Carl Rove sent a prostitute in. They tried to hire some people to compromise him. L.A. Spitzer was caught and drummed out of office. Richardson of New Mexico, there's a pattern here. They went after every Democrat <coughs> a governor. And why Blagojevich, um, as calmly as he's taken this, there must be some type of deal where he's getting out, but why Blagojevich didn't fight it and point out that they went after all these governors. And this is called road behind that, the type of thing he does. So maybe on appeal, they're going to do something about that. But uh, while we're amending the Constitution, why don't we discard the Constitution and get another one? We're talking about a constitutional convention. That's going to be really, really hard. And I'm not sure if it's going to be good. That's right. Huh? Okay. Is that? Okay. There's, there's more. Uh, you mentioned uh, Representative Jan Tchaikovsky. Uh, I want to know is she a representative? Does she support your efforts, or if she's not your representative, have you uh, contacted the representative that covers your area and asked for his or her support? Well, that's an interesting question because uh, I spent many years working against Mark Kirk and, uh, and then against Bob Dole, who I saw today, who uh, represents the 10th Congressional District Democrat, who is no moderate. Um, I, I was moved by redistricting into Jan's this last year. So I'm now with Jan, but I work in the tent all the time because uh, I think they need a lot of work there in terms of, of getting a Democrat elected. And Bob and I are working in Phyllis for Ilya Shaman. Um, Bob Dold is, is represents the Tea Party, and he's backed by the Koch brothers, I can tell you that. So we don't want him in there, at least I don't. Um, and, and Jan represents to me everything you want in Congress, so I, I'm not quite answering your question, but I'm now in the ninth, and I'm, I, so I sort of cross borders all the time with all the various groups I'm in. I, I work both 10th Dems and, and the ninth and whatever. Whoever, I mean, we're, you know what I think, we're all citizens of, of this country, so I don't care what district I work for. What were you going to... Thank you. Okay. Now. Go ahead. All right. What is your group doing to solve the most important question in Chicago, namely to get the Cubs in the World Series? Oh, 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 that would be my, oh, i got to tell you this. My husband, who's sitting here and listens to my politics all the time, he is in heaven because, what's the reason, Rob? You have a new, new coach who he has all the faith in the world in, and this is going to be a great season. I mean, he promised. He promised. I'm telling you, this is a true fan over here. And with this new coat, he's just thrilled. He's like a kid. You know, what can I tell you? He's like, well, just like a kid. Just so you know, Epstein was also a Beatles manager. And look what happened to them. Okay. Well, oh. you look at it that way. Beatles had talent. Yeah. Go ahead. Charles? You mean I get a question I don't get yelled at? <laughs> uh, Sandy, I'm admittedly... Sharon, me? me? Or Sharon, Sharon, rather. Sharon Sanders. So I'm uh, admittedly a corrupt union official. Ooh. And do you think by changing the bylaws of my local, it's going to have some effect upon me? I mean, seriously. You want to get rid of this one thing, element, but are you for campaign reform? Absolutely. I mean, what sense? I mean, what if... That's what you make. What is your pro program? That's why I'm saying to you that it all has to be done. Campaign reform, election law reform, all of this, getting money out of politics. That's why I'm not just for move to amend. And even, even move to amend, I'm not sure I like the wording right now. I think as we worked on, and there's many, many cons, I, I mean, I could read them to you. I did bring them. Many different amendments being proposed. Um, yeah, that gets rid of. What? That gets rid of the court case. But what do the organization stand for? The organization, what and that's what I'm saying, the, the organization move to amend stands for, an, stands for an amendment. I can read it to you if you want to be bored to death, and I can read. 
there's various versions of resolutions depending whether it's a city resolution or a state resolution. Do you want to hear the words? I can read it to you. No. But what are your ideas for reforming the political process? I think we have to do it all. I, I really mean that when I think about it. I think that in, in order to get change, you have to, in order to, to tell our congressional uh, representatives, uh, the Senate and the and and Congress, that we are not going to take it. We have to assault them from all sides. I don't think an amendment, an amendment which is going to, I'm working for it, is going to take a long, long time. Because you've got to get the two thirds of this and three fourths of that. So meanwhile, while we're doing that, while we're collecting signatures and, and, and informing people about that this country is theirs, not, not the corporate owners, we have to then ask, tell Congress, like Durbin, and he's doing this, we want laws that will change election law, election reform. We can do that. I mean, there's not a, there's not a problem. They have to know we're, we're in back of that. We have to push the FCC to, to, to change the the rules for the media and how they do advertising and how much advertising can be done. That can be done. We have to push at all levels. That's, I, that's why I'm going back to the regulatory agencies. They are so awful. The SEC, the S awful. And the FCC is critical, according to what I'm reading, because they are the media. And don't forget, the FCC was owned by, by uh, um, what's his name, the, the uh, Colin Powell's son, Michael Powell. And that whole bunch, Kevin Martin and all that, are extreme right-wingers. And they're willing to give the corporations everything, and they have them. So we have to go after that. And I don't think there's anything we can, left, we can leave unturned, in my opinion. And you have to do it all at the same time. And when, by doing that, you're informing the public what's at stake. These people do not know what's being taken away from them. I'll repeat that again. If the right wing has their way, and, I'll, and I know you're ready to pounce on me, there will be no health care. There will be no health care, no Social Security Trust Fund, no Medicaid. It will all be privatized. God knows what will happen to it. I mean, I went to a Joe Walsh town hall meeting, and here's his answer. We'll give you a $7,000 voucher for education and for health, and you're fine. Well, okay, what do you do with that? What do you do with 7000 for education? And what school is going to take that? I mean, and, and what's that going to do for, for premium? This is their answers. So, you know, this is what I'm saying to you. We have to go fight it to the nail. You just have no choice. Yes? Right. A lot better. Um, you want a microphone? No, thanks. I think everybody can't hear me on the mic. Stand up. Stand up. Um, back uh, when Citizens United was still in force, uh, when Michael Moore's movie came out, Fahrenheit 9 11, that was also challenged. Then there would be this big committee meeting to decide whether it was a, a for profit venture or was it a, a political uh, advertisement and all that. Do, we, do you realize what you're getting into here if you reverse the decision? We'll be going to back to that. We'll have to have panels <coughs> decide if a movie or a book is is it is it is the uh, was the creation of it uh, for uh, for profit to, to serve uh, you know for entertainment or was it to, is it a piece of political advertising? Do we want the government deciding stuff like that? I would feel not that I believe the government is the end all deal, but I would be more comfortable with the government than with uh, the corporations. And, and I'm not anti-corporation, and I don't think we're going back to that. I don't think we're going back to that. I think the problem with the Hillary Clinton uh, uh, movie that it all started with was the fact it was based on some, a bunch of lies and about her, and that, that freedom of speech to make up lies, and that's the Fox mentality that we can. In the name of freedom of speech, we can say whatever we want. Well, don't you, that think, was, don't you think that we're smart enough to, to read, read or see things and no. make up our own minds? No. Oh, no. Ah. But I'm not going to no, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to, I know. Now you see the line between totalitarianism. No, so I don't see that line. Right? Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 No, 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 no. Let's go to rebuttal, Brian. No, I'm not, I think that there's no line there. I'm saying free speech, uh, uncensored speech is fine, and I'm not objecting to that. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not in favor of totalitarianism, uh, and I'm not a socialist. I'm none of that stuff. I believe in people and progressive values where we're all equal. So I think that. Uh, so I think you know. I think the argument is not valid that you're, you're throwing at me. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, is there anybody who has not had a question? Just the lady in back there. So really, is this uh, 
a love of money issue. It really goes down to the love of money is the first of all evil. I mean, in my opinion, away, yeah. And isn't this truly bribery and kickbacks? Okay. Is that what we're talking about? We, we, we are, I mean, and I'm going to tell you that. Corruption. Yeah. It's corruption. I mean, I happen to like money. I happen to be able, and I'm going to explain this. The love of money is the sort of all evil. No. All right. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that I like to have money to go see my kids in California. It's not money, it's the love of right, right. The greed is what is the greed. At what point do you say I have enough? I have enough. I'm going to give. And the whole thing, the whole society, should be the love of your fellow. <laughs> exactly right, and I agree with you, and I think we'd be fine. Why should I have more? Why should I be suffering? And you have a mansion, right? Well. I, I'm not sure. I don't care if you. I don't care if you have a mansion. If you made your money not at other people's expense, uh, personally, that's how I feel about it. I don't. I think if you made your money fair and square, but if you make it at the cost of other human beings, that's different. We should I, all be humanitarians. So bottom line, it goes back to. All right, you've asked your I'm in agreement with you, I, but I, you know, and I, I'm not going to tell you that I think money's fine to have, and I think it's a fine. It's, it's nice to be able to have a decent house, a decent car. It's a question of how much you need until you're at the point where you have made other people suffer. That is my criteria. You look at Steve Jobs and you see what happened there. How many people suffered because he could not, you know, at the cost of Apple, which is a great, I mean, a great company. He went to the other extreme, and he's not the only one. They all threw their money overseas. How many mansions, how many cars, how many houses, whatever. Okay, Mary Bennett. And the way the problem is, bigger than that. I mean, you can say a question, question period. Question period. It is the question period. Rebuttals will be afterwards. I, 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 I believe in, the, in, in your premise, but at what point do you say, you know, enough is enough? The current, uh, you know, economic crisis was, in fact, started started from a significant reduction in the amount of disposable income, therefore driving down demand and and lessening you know, uh, economic activity to begin with. That's how this whole mess started in the first place. So I, I like to comment on that. You know, there there is a rule of thumb, like in Germany, that they, and I'm not sure that it would be democratic to do it here, but that the CEOs can only make a certain percentage of the average worker. Now, you can't officially do that here, but I think that when you get to the, where the point, which we are this year, where it's almost 500%, greater than the lower paid, lowest paid worker, then you have a situation not only where it's agreed, but where they've lost all touch with, with the worker. When you take thousands of workers at one time and say, we can't afford you anymore, you're out the door, then we've lost it. And that's what's happened here. So again, I'm going to say to you that I think having money in a, in a democracy, in a capitalist society is fine. And making a fair you know, profit is fine. Nothing wrong with that. But not at the, I think the cutoff is, are you, are you taking away your, your employees' health care? and benefits and retirement. The average worker now cannot put a penny into retirement. They have done, they don't make enough to do that. And by the time they get to retirement, my you know, way before my age now, they'll they'll have no social security because the Republicans and the right wing will take it away from them. So do we want that? I and mean, you know this is the whole thing. I see nothing wrong with the safety net. I think it's one of the best things we ever did. You put it in my in my thing is you put it all the way till you're you're done working. You don't have to stop at a cutoff. We wouldn't have a problem. So I think I, my thing, greed is the point where your workers are are abused, and that's what I think I'm seeing every single day in this country is the abuse of workers. So I see a hand way in the back. Okay. Well, I'm just
our system so that the distribution could be a little better because, you know, greed is like, it's not going to stop greed. It's always going to be there. And people with money are always going to be out there, you know, looking for more. So the only way you're going to change it, in my, in my thinking, is you've got to have a different business model. You know, maybe the, these are the big corporations that you call up and you could only get a hold of them, you know, a half hour later or whatever, you know, through the voice prompts. Maybe there should be some action against, you know, these companies. Is that the question? Well, hey, so I I'm, I'm, I'm saying... Uh, a number of ideas. Well, we need a question. Okay. If you want to make a <laughs> comment, is, we have a comment is. period coming up. But you have to come up here to one of these chairs and get in line. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to I'll comment. Okay. Pretty good. Okay. So, uh, I guess the question is, why go after the political system? The but how, because I don't have no idea how you possibly do that because you'd have to get through the corporation corporate system first. My feeling is that we should have put pressure on Obama first of all to have reverse incentives for corporations to bring the money back here, and I think you can do that and stop the tax loopholes and all kinds of things and say to these corporations, you're not citizens. If you're not paying taxes here and all your workers are overseas, you're not American citizens. I mean, I don't see how you could possibly get the corporations to change their own structure, and that's in Congress and at the state level, because our, our Congress people and our legislatures are so bought and paid for by these same corporations. To change it has to come from outside. You know, I, I just don't see it coming from in, internally. They're not going to do it. They have it too good. good. Yes. Bernie? Yes, for the initial implosion with the economy seemed to be with the mortgages. And do you see a second wave coming with credit cards? With credit what? Credit cards. Credit card debt. I don't. I personally don't see it's going to be any different than it was before. I think. I, I think it's just going to stay as is. I, I. I was worried about that. Now I don't see anything different coming. People will continue to pay ten dollars a month or whatever it is on their mortgages on their credit cards, and since the economy is a little bit better, and I'm not sure what that means yet. I'm not sure about those numbers. But they can put in a few more dollars on their credit card, and, and I don't think it's going to happen. I think I think we're not done with the mortgage problems yet. Okay. What they're going to do with what they're doing, and I was I was part of the Occupy movement, going out in certain neighborhoods, and we tried to sit in houses or, or to move back in houses. Um, we have to do things like that to retake these houses rather than allow them to raise take the house down. Because these banks and mortgage companies are so corrupt, they'd rather knock the house down than help you stay in it. So I'm not so worried about the credit cards. I don't think anything's gonna happen. I think it's they they I think the companies are so reliant on the credit card business that they will do everything possible to keep it going. That because without it, what do they have? You know, Christmas came, what did they do? They they charged everything. They didn't use cash. So I that's where I, I probably what? I'm sorry. No, nothing. I was uh, trying to get Brahms' attention. Yes, okay. Walter Collins has the next question. Lately, some reporters have been saying that uh, Glass-Steagall, with only 34 pages, saved the country for quite a long time, right. well, 70 years. Now, Dodd-Frank <coughs> has 2,300 pages, and, the, and a lot of people are saying there is so much to it that there's probably be so many loopholes that Dodd Frank won't work. What's your opinion on that? Again, I'm not. I'm an, I, I'll look at it as an investor. I think that they'll do anything to destroy Dodd, Dodd uh, Frank because they don't want any kind of anybody to do watch over them at all. Now it may not be a perfect bill, but I think from what I've been reading about it, and like the, the business section of Bloomberg and all that is that, yes, it's, it's got a lot of loopholes, but it's better than anything. They want nothing, in my opinion. They want no restrictions on them whatsoever. And the Dodd, Dodd, Dodd Frank gives them some of the corporations some restrictions. They don't like it in Wall Street. So that's my opinion. And, you know, I can't say I'm an expert. I look at it as an investor. And I think the Stiegel Glass is something totally different. I don't know how long, long or short. All I know about Stiegel Glass is that, of course, you couldn't mix banking and mortgages and all that together. 
And now, there's, because of that, you have so many conflicts of interest that keep feeding each other in a circle. And I think it's the worst thing possible that you could have. The, the more, I mean, what happened to all our laws about, uh, about um, monopolies? I mean, they're totally ignored. You look, at, you look at Comcast, which owns NBC and MSNBC, and, a, you know, and ABC and all of them, and, and nobody's stopping the monopolies. And that scares me because everybody is terrified now to, to step in and do something. I mean, you, you have scared Congress men and women. They're terrified. They, they, they're going to lose their source of income, which is the lobbies. And if you go to Washington, which I have, and you see it, you cannot believe it. Now, let me, let me say this. Somebody corrected me. Lobbying in the South is not bad. Because if you have a cause, you want to go to Washington or Springfield and you want to work for that cause. It's when you say to the Congress people, uh, I will take you on a vacation, I'll buy you this, if you vote for me, that's a whole different thing. And that was pointed out to me when I said, let's stop while lobbying, and this, this expert said, no, you don't want to stop that because you want to work for, for the ecology, you know, the economy and all that stuff and, and the environment. It's when they pay off, which they're doing, which is so awful. So. Yeah. Yes, Charles? Yes, Sharon. Now, if I was running for president of the college conferences, <laughs> and according to you, what if the Lincoln restaurant wanted to give money and make a contribution to my campaign? Would you allow that? Now, Tim is running against me, but Paul and they are going to give him money. Is that allowed? I'm going to step, going to go out on a limb and say no. I don't think the place that you're working at should give, am I answering this right? Uh, <laughs> should give one person money and not the other. I think they should stay out of it. It's a conflict of interest. Would that satisfy you? Your answer. Uh, right, of course. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, Tim for president. Tim, I think you're rubbing yes. up. Yes. I think the corporation does not get some kind of assistance from the government. Now, again, it's not that I know of. I mean, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. But they all get it indirectly, don't they, from loopholes and all that? That's government well, welfare. Well, I mean, government welfare. Well, welfare for the rich. Yeah, it is welfare for the rich. It's exactly what it is. But they write their own laws so they can do it. You know, when the corporations say, well, uh, I can take this, these tax breaks because, I mean, it's in the law. Well, of course, because you wrote the law with your lobbyists. And that's exactly what they're doing. And the fact that GE has not paid one penny in taxes is criminal. Criminal. I and mean, they're not the only ones. And when they say they pay 35%, that's not the average. I mean, with, with all their loopholes, it's not. So uh, my answer is that we should, you know, get rid of the taxes. I mean, we should put the taxes back on the rich. They could take care of our economy and all the problems in public education and all the other things that we're destroying, the infrastructure. <laughs> so it's time to, to, to tax the, the wealthy fairly. Do you think that if uh, government was a little smaller and limited, like maybe concerned basically with fighting for the common defense and enforcing contracts, do you think there would be so much competition by corporations to try to influence laws and politicians? I still think there would be. You're talking about the libertarian viewpoint? I, I think they still would. I think it's the nature of the corporations. They want to be in control. They want the power. They want to control the people. Yeah. You've got millions of people here. They want to be able to control you. They don't want to not know what you're doing. Yes. Uh, Harold Tiger. If corporations are persons, can't we draft them and send them off to fight our wars? <laughs> And these, these CEOs get paid like, like there are 350 or 500 of us. Let's get four of them. That'll be a brigade. Send them off to fight. Two more than a thousand people. Or better yet. I'm going to make a, you know, and, and sort of indirectly I'll comment that one of the things that, that, that really disgusts me the most about the whole thing, what you're talking about, this, is, is that when it came to the Iraq War, the, the uh, army would go into the school uh, yards and they sort of, you know, pick these kids up and, and these poor kids and they would take them and put them in, you know, into the army. And then when they came back with PSD or, or uh, PTS rather, PTSD, sorry, and half their bodies missing, you never see them, you never saw the body bags, we were never allowed to see right. these kids. 
And I worked really hard against the Iraq War because I thought it was strictly a war for oil, uh, or for, for, for baby Bush, you know, the baby to, to prove to Daddy that he was as good as him. Uh, we lost so many kids, but they were poor kids. They weren't your kids, my kids, or whatever. And so we never even saw them. And this is what corporations are all about. They're not going to have a draft again. They'll never do it because they would have uh, parents screaming and yelling like they did in the 60s. And I think putting the CEOs to war, how many of our Congress people ever went in the Army or their kids? Almost none. So uh, that's what, you know, I think it's a good idea. Put them all on the tanks and let them go. And put them in the tanks without the IED protections. You know, we have all this money, but we couldn't, we couldn't take care of our, our uh, soldiers by having them having those, you know, these bees on the bottom of their tanks. So they blew up. You know, it, it, it's really crazy. We have money for all this and that, but we don't have it to take care of our young soldiers. But we're off the topic, so. Who are new to the college. Uh, we do have a rebuttal period, which I think from the uh, slowness of your uh, questions, uh, it's coming up shortly. Um, we have a bunch of chairs over here. Uh, we play musical chairs. The uh, person over on my right, your left, uh, on the end of the uh, chairs is the uh, first to speak. And we then play musical chairs. And uh, whoever wants to speak tries to get online to do so. The question is how many uh, people are going to speak? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thirty-five minutes each. About six. <laughs> from about five to six minutes. So uh, about five minutes. Uh, uh, at least five minutes. Uh, you don't have to take up the full five minutes, but uh, uh, after five minutes, it's somebody else's turn. Okay. Make can sure I make a request? One request. Um, can I walk around and get signatures if you're interested in signing on to move to a men? Would that be? Uh, yes, you have to listen. Okay, then I'll. Okay. I'm going to I will listen. Just pass your sheet around. You mean you have to listen to some of this? <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank our speaker. Yay. Be gentle, right? Be gentle. Be gentle. Be gentle. Um, I. Uh, would like to condense as much as possible these difficult ideas to, 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 to see what's going on. Uh, first, uh, this was a very inspiring presentation. Thank you very much. Second, I think we are confronting an abyss as a, as a human as a society. Third, humanity has made a deal with the devil, yeah. aka the fossil energy, the seemingly inexhaustible energy period is coming to an end. And I think we are feeling the first convulsions of the inexorable changes coming. Fourth, in preparation of the changes, the cabal in power is grabbing as much of the resources <coughs> as they could probably put their hands on. And as I can see, the future doesn't not look good for us or for the Earth itself. We are, we are fighting a tremendous foe. Here, here. In preparation of the changes, the cabal in power is grabbing as much of the resources as they could possibly can. As I, as, and as I can see, the future does, does not look good, good for us or for the Earth itself in this, is this grabbing for, for resources and for power. And finally, I think that empathy is a necessary human feeling if we want to have a peaceful world. And I see 
that many of these ideologies, libertarian and others, that we are spread, they are being expressed here, they are totally lacking of that human feeling of empathy. They are so imbued in their own selves. And I don't think that is a good uh, future if you don't have that empathy. Communism is very <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to also congratulate the speaker on the vigor of her presentation. But alas, uh, that vigor based on a faith, an opinion, uh, is, uh, not, well, is not well informed. She told us quite clearly that the uh, Constitution was written for the people. And a reasonable examination of it, the states formed the Constitution oh, and created a new entity called the federal government. It's as simple as that. There is no doubt about it. A more perfect union among the states was established. The we the people clause was necessary for us to allow the states to form the improved union. That's what that we the people refers to. Oh, libertarian gibberish. <laughs> and, and, but, so she, her faith is admirable, but her faith is misinformed. As Charlie would say about his local preacher. <laughs> uh, she, uh, I, I weighed her opinion. She told me, as you all heard, that she was going to show me in the Constitution where the Supreme Court has no jurisdiction to rule on election law. She's right. I think. I'd like to see it. I'm getting it. In any event, to the point of the meeting that I thought we were coming to to learn why Citizens United should be repealed, I have to remind everybody that they should read it. Corporations are, it used to be called joint stock companies, by which natural individuals pull their capital together to form a mighty enterprise. I don't believe that U.S. Steel could possibly be capitalized by, you know, uh, tens of thousands of people with $500. And if they did it as partners, they would have individual liability. And that's why they are called corporations. They have been given a body before the law. They're absolutely essential. Now, in any event, the federal government is not involved in most corporations. There are some inequities. This can be handled by having our states change the corporate documents as to what powers corporations have. But no one is, I have ever heard that spoke on these subjects has even thought of that. But it's obvious that at the state level, where we can have the greatest effect, and all this other drivel is irrelevant. This is all irrelevant drivel. Uh, there's um, tremendous contradictions in the campus. Like we know, 1% owns most of the wealth. And we've had a lot of reform movements throughout the ages. We've had the abolitionist movement under Frederick Douglass and uh, Floyd Garrison and other people that have worked years and years and years. In England, too, you had the same movement. And it took them about 100 years before it became a law for women to vote. Finally, they got it in the 1920s. And these were all good movements. You also had the labor movement. And I remember back in Salt Lake City, when an anarchist was about to be sentenced to death, and people got up in the middle of the uh, square in Salt Lake City and made speeches against the death penalty and to try to get this anarchist out of prison. 
So here comes the police, and they kept arresting them, and they kept putting them in prison, and they put hundreds and hundreds and hundreds in prison. Finally, it came to the point where they had to let them go. But still, more came and more came and more came until they got to the spot, to the point where they allowed them to speak. They didn't release the prisoner, they hanged him. But still, we have a free speech movement. And it's all to the very good. That's why we're speaking here today. It wasn't that the government gave us this. It was done, all, all this was done through pressure from below grassroots. And people who think along the lines, well, this president gave us this, this president gave us that, they did, but they were pressured to do it. They didn't do it because they wanted to give it to you. They were pressured to give it because of the grassroots. Under Roosevelt, we had social democracy, and it was given to us. But before they had social democracy, they had people in the uh, factories, occupying the factories. And when they occupied the factories, the police came eventually and pulled them out. But this took a long time, and eventually Roosevelt recognized the unions, and but the Taft-Hartley Act came along eventually and put the pressure on the unions and they didn't have the, uh, the clout that they had before. At one time, we had something like 35% in the unions. Now it's about 6 or 8%, and the government a little more, and they're trying to break that. So we had all these uh, movements for democracy, for reform, and you could probably name 100 different ones that we have. But now we've come to a point where all these things are very good, and I congratulate the uh, speaker for talking about it. But there is something basically wrong here, and very basically wrong. When all this keeps going, all these movements, the big corporations are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The small fish are eaten up by the big fish. The big fish gain more power. And when you gain more power, you gain more wealth. And when you gain more wealth, you control the system. So what is to be done? Well, the way I see it, call it what you want. Call it socialism. Call it whatever you want. But the people that work in the factories, work in the mines, work in the offices, work in the banks, should not own these things. They should own it together. In other words, it should be common ownership of production. Yeah. This is the only way you can solve the problem. Now, some people call it socialism, let them call it whatever they want. I'm going to talk about this. Uh, I think it's uh, in uh, June 27th or something like that. And I'll give a more detailed speech of what I'm talking about so we can get a better picture of what eventually would have to happen to solve all these problems, like pollution and uh, all these evils that we have around us, all this greed that we have around us. Because greed is not something inborn. It's something that is developed, and I'll talk about that. <laughs> Our, our president and of the College of Complexes, uh, it, it, Charlie, you're going away. <laughs> the president candidate of the uh, College of Complexes correctly identified our speaker's proposal as a form of Fabian socialism. And Fabian socialism is really necessary in order to make the public and the ordinary people aware of what's going on. But the history of political economics in the United States and industrial world show that legislative reform is not possible 
for permanent reform. Our speaker may be charged and convicted and imprisoned for advocating violent action. She said, quote, let us assault our legislators, et cetera, et cetera. She meant it as a metaphor, I'm sure. And, uh, but will the courts consider that when the chief's charged and brought before them? No. <laughs> but it's something else. The concept of a peaceful revolution is, is admittedly ridiculous. Okay? The Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the Cuban Revolution, they were formulated by an intellectual elite. But once started, uh, the ordinary people joined in in force and uh, completed the uh, efforts. Thank you. There's a chapter in Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America on the Supreme Court. And one of the main points is that the power of the courts is the power of public opinion. If the Supreme Court is ever composed of bad or unwise men, the Union might be plunged into anarchy or civil war. He wrote that about 20 years before it actually happened with the Dred Scott decision. I think we have to have some fundamental understanding of how the court system works. I think people ought to learn how to use uh, the public opinion just too flaccid in this country. Very few people know how to use a law library. It's not that hard. You can't really make very intelligent legal opinions without understanding what's in the law library. Now, this is Citizens United. It's one of these decisions that says this is interest outweighs that interest. Uh, you know, what's free speech and what is corruption and it's a kind of arbitrary pronouncement as to which is which. It's not what you call bright line law, which has a very definite uh, a very definite understanding to it. And I think, uh, you know, here's the controversy about original intent. Well, what the people who are against original intent, what they want to do is they just kind of want to make up the laws as they go along. And that's part of the Citizens United problem. Now, let me tell you where we get to some bright line law. They look at the, the real original intent, like the Federalist Papers and the debates on the Constitutional Convention and uh, the debates on the Bill of Rights in the first Congress. And one point that I've been trying to get across for about 40 years now is that the draft is unconstitutional. When the firm said raise and support armies, they meant paid professional armies. And this, you can see from various clubs, passages in the Federalist Papers and the Constitutional Convention and so on. And this supposed champion of original intent by the name of Robert Bork, he put out a book that said in so many words that this idea of self-ownership just gets takes too much, takes hold too much. The government will not be able to draft an army to support itself. <coughs> he also said a few things about it. Uh, a judge who ruled against paper money would not have a law clerk and have a guardian. And, you know, he said that in so many words. But I think if we're going to cultivate some public opinion, that's what the law is. I think people are going to have to learn to use the law library and read up on these various sources of original intent. 
and we get these decisions, which are not very knowing decisions, we're just going to throw things one way or the other. And just holding up a finger in the wind, basically. But, uh, It's not that hard to use a law library, but it's not that easy either. And I don't know something about it because I've uh, had a number of pro se cases. That's representing yourself and my sure without a lawyer uh, in my life. And my deceased former landlord asked me, I'm going to do another one. Well, I have something else I can talk about. I don't think that go for tonight anyway. But I think it's, uh, I think we have to look for bright lines, not just in law, but in politics and a few other things. And it's not just a matter of holding up fingers in the wind, where a lot of people are doing in the way uh, Citizens United and Bush versus Gore and a few other, you know, they, you know, they, they don't really have any basis. And there's something that jeopardizes the legitimacy of the courts. If they don't have legitimacy, the courts could do nothing. They're not even a college of complexes. But anyway, uh, uh, five seconds. Well, anyway, I think what you got to do is hit the books. Thank you. I'm pretty much in agreement with uh, just about everybody and all their statements. But in particular, this last gentleman, when he talked about the law library, that really got me geared up uh, because I've forced myself in the past year to do just that, to go to the Cook County Law Library and read. Uh, so I think it's a great idea. And I think I heard someone say that the uh, this corporate deal, I, I think it came about what uh, Obama collected too much money or so much money the Republicans couldn't compete. So they, they found some way of getting money from the corporations. I don't know if that's right, but that's what I understood. And I heard someone here say that the um, some clerk actually wrote in the law or, or, or legitimized it in some way. Uh, so I think his suggestion about filing some kind of a legal action might be just the easiest way to approach this. And uh, you know, certainly, with as many knowledgeable people as we have here, uh, we could put at least some kind of a group together to explore that possibility. But my thought uh, was regarding the corporations. And uh, if you really want to be effective, you hit them in the pocket moment. And we all know that people, especially, you know, the common person like myself, will respond to value. Uh, you got people that are off of work, and if you could figure out a way to put these guys together and put them to work, you know, you're going to have some committed people. Uh, they're going to be your new union people. Uh, you know, a, a more broad form of a union, as you're saying, they're losing numbers. So I, I was suggesting that the, the whole business system should be looked at and, and small groups, again, should get together and come up with another model, whether it's a cooperative, an employee-owned, you know, uh, operations. There's quite a few. We just need more. Now, I did a little bit of, of, of searching on the internet, and um, this was about uh, utilities. and. Um, I, I guess they go per mile. So if you have a utility company like ComEd, for a mile, they may serve 50,000 people. And if you have a small co-op utility, 
somewhere in a, in a, in a small rural area, uh, they may serve uh, for the same mile 5,000 people. Yet those small co-ops actually deliver power, according to what I've read, for less money than the one that's got, you know, 50,000. So the point is that uh, the Wall Street movement, uh, supposedly, uh, the problem they're having from the commentary I heard is they don't have an agenda. They don't have, they're not focused on, you know, any one thing, okay? But that's a perfect uh, platform uh, for somebody that knows how to approach it uh, to come up with different business models. Uh, I don't want to go to Walmart. I, I think their prices are too high. You know, I, I know they're too high, but uh, the same money that screwed up the housing market is doing that to, to, to fuel. They're doing it to food. Just on the internet last night, where chickens can't even walk in the hen house. They're so fat so fast, you know, so they're just dying out, okay? And, you know, we're the people who pay for them. So, I'm saying, uh, I'm here to support this cause because I think it's, uh, you know, outrageous. But at the same time, I think we have to look at different ways of achieving the common goal, you know. And, you know, it's easy to get people to go along if they could benefit. Okay, they, you know, they're busy going to work, but if they could benefit from going to that job, or if they could benefit from going to the store, I think you're going to have people more committed. And I thank you for the time. It's refreshing to have uh, the speaker over a certain age, I, I would say over 15, that use those. Watch it. <laughs> uh, you're in trouble now, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Use that longevity to be part of history. And if you're part of history, you've been sensitive to history. And if you're sensitive to history, you know something about history. And if you don't understand what the speaker said tonight, which was spoken as facts in the sense in which she was uh, narrating. <laughs> now, uh, we, uh, if you got a problem, you got to recognize you got a problem. You got to know what the problem is. Now, the problem that she has in all of us citizens of the United States is that we don't have no <coughs> government. Our government been hijacked, and that government hijacked by the few, and those are the people that run the world. They are the few, and they run the world. Now, if we had a government, we could go to our senators, our representatives. We could go to our government. We could go to our regulators and say and demand that a solution is forthcoming. Well, if they, the senators, and the representatives, and the governors and others, owned by the people that run the world, who in the hell are they working for? <laughs> They're working for the people that run the world. <coughs> now, what we have is a delusion. What we have is smoke and merit before us. And since we're so weak and we got this Stockholm Syndrome, we got amnesia, and we ain't used our longevity to keep our eyes where they're supposed to be, and our ears where are supposed to be, and our mind where they're supposed to be. So therefore, they can tell us anything. But the facts are so clear. How can you not see it? I'm saying when, when, when the cooperation in the few, the people that run the world, that can go to the senator and the representative with laws already written and say, this is what I want you to pay for me and you know it ain't nothing against their interests. I'm not saying this. Louise Slaughter, a representative from New York State, said that on radio, and I was listening to her. She said the laws we passed is brought in here by the big corporation and all the uh, people that they had to come in, and they always written, they said, this is what we want. Now, if that's what it is, who is in charge? The people that run the world. Not your center, not the president. The president and all the rest of them was 
probably be expected the president was selected before he was elected. In fact, that's why I threw, and, and, and by the way, I threw my registration card, my vote card away five years ago. That was before Obama. And the reason I did it, I didn't want to be part of no joke. If I want to be part of a joke, because it's a joke. If they're going to put two people up there and say, you vote for him, you vote for her, you vote for him, or you vote for her. And both of them are Siamese twins, and they've been selected before I had a chance to elect it. And even if I'm having to elect the wrong one, the vote don't count no way. Now, the person that can go to the government, and that's in quote, what we call government, and determine whether they go to war or not is the guy in charge. The government ain't in charge. If you're going to go to the government and determine whether you go, people going to die or not, you are in charge. Now, did I make that up? No. The President of the United States told us about the military industrial complex when I was a teenager. But I was part of history. And I don't suffer from amnesia, and I'm not in the now. If if, if, they, uh, if they tell the government, say, listen, you're going to have to give me hundreds of billions of dollars. Other than that, if you don't, you're going to fail. Now, if I tell you that, you ain't the goddamn government. You my, you my subordinate. Why am I telling you? You should be telling me something. Now, if we don't, and the speaker, I'm listening to the lady said everything that I would say. We ain't got a country. We have to get it back. How we get it back? Well, I would be a night to speak to tell you how to get it back. But I tell you what, listen, people, how can you keep deluding yourself when you vote for somebody they selected and the people that run the world, you don't vote for them. <coughs> when you voted for chairman of so and so, when did you vote for the guy that had uh, uh, guy in the paper there, uh, the, 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 the county house, the, 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 the Wall Street? You, do you vote for them people? Do you, no. you don't even know them. Some of so the people that you read by the paper ain't is the front people. They are not the ones that run the world. Until I can vote for the people that run the world. I'm not voting for nobody. If we need, if we need, if we need a constitutional amendment, it's a constitutional amendment that the folks that run the world have to step forward and give me and everybody else their name so we can decide who to vote for. That's a new approach. I guess a little comment on the last rebuttal. Michael Moore, I saw him on TV, and he said, uh, gee, the 1% have two major parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. Don't you think that the rest of us ought to have at least two or three other parties? I think there's something to be said for that. There's certainly a uh, I, I uh, am in the district covered by Jan Representative Janet Chikowski, and she's the best I ever had. Of course, uh, two of the ones I had just had is uh, Rod Blagojevich and uh, Ron Emanuel. I had some better ones than that. She's still the best of the lot. Uh, not perfect, but the best of the lot. Bernie Sanders, I just gave him money today. So I'm sort of close to where the speaker is. Um, one thing I will say about the speaker, at least uh, in my perception of it, it helps to have an outline if you're going to speak and to follow the outline. That might help. Uh, I am uh, more pessimistic than the speaker, but I uh, totally agree with her that you might as well keep trying. I won't be here that long, okay. so I might as well keep going. Uh, one example of that, uh, uh, we talked about corporate personhood. Uh, Tom Hartman wrote a book about that. I forget the title, but he wrote a whole book about it. You use social, Unitarian Universalists for Social Concerns have a uh, 
a workshop on that on corporate personhood. Yeah, and many right. people have been working on corporate personhood to uh, overthrow that and have amendment to the Constitution. It hasn't gone very far. A lot of these uh, uh, reform movements just don't go very far. Again, I think we ought to keep trying. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Doug Pickley, and let you know I've uh, mentioned a few times here that I worked with the uh, Citizens Party uh, back in the 80s, uh, progressive uh, uh, political party. Uh, I'm proud to be a liberal uh, progressive as it goes. Uh, and um, it's interesting, um, you know, it's a shame what has happened in our country that it's moved to far to the right. Uh, uh, I saw a um, uh, quote from Barry Goldwater, uh, was mentioned um, by uh, two different commentators uh, uh, recently, uh, that Barry Goldwater was actually pro-choice, which is an amazing thing uh, to contemplate in this day and age. Um, just, uh, it's, it's appalling. I mean, I wish we did have a Republican Party that had principled Republicans and uh, Republicans that uh, uh, respected uh, uh, people's rights more. Uh, the, the whole aspect of this um, uh, corporate personhood, um, it has been discussed here before at the college. Uh, uh, a lady named uh, Julia Perry had uh, brought it up a uh, uh, time past. Uh, I did happen to purchase her book, uh, and I uh, looked at part of it when I was um, uh, perusing it, uh, and she did have the uh, information about it. Uh, uh, so that it does go back to that uh, situation of that clerk adding that in. Uh, it's quite clear on its face that uh, a corporation is not a person. It's ridiculous. Uh, that's just uh, sleight of hand, some terminology that uh, someone, uh, I mean, the, the court at that time could have decided it, but because the clerk is the one who put it in there. There was no need for the court any time in the future to go along with that decision. But they they have decided to do that, and so unfortunately we are stuck with that. We have the problem uh, ever since uh, Marbury versus Madison that the uh, Supreme Court has decided that they were supreme. And uh, although that was not spelled out in the Constitution, um, we are stuck with that as legal precedent now, and it's been here for over 200 years. Now, the um, since it is on from a common sense standpoint, it is ridiculous to call a corporation a uh, person. Uh, clearly, I mean, if that was the case, then the automatic thing is that they should be subject to the highest income tax rate for an individual because they all make um, that much money to get into the highest income tax bracket. So they should be all taxed and they shouldn't have the same. Loop. They have special loopholes for corporations. Well, if they were persons, then they wouldn't. They, you wouldn't be able to do that. So. It's clearly an illogical thing for the court to maintain that and then not like enforce the, the income tax laws for persons <laughs> against corporations and, and say, oh, Congress, well, then they don't have a right to uh, have separate uh, uh, tax laws. So that's clearly a, a case where um, they're not being common sense or logical or scientific about it at all. Uh, but of course, we know the law doesn't have to be scientific, I guess. Anyway. Uh, um, I really want to commend the speaker. I'm um, very glad that someone is so enthusiastic about uh, being involved in all of these good uh, progressive causes. Uh, I'm glad that there are people that are interested in trying to go after this uh, appalling decision, um, the so-called Citizens United decision. Um, as you know, however, though, that um, for a con constitutional amendment, you need two-thirds of the uh, uh, Congress, both houses, to approve it, and then you also have to get the state legislatures to approve it. That's why it's been so seldom done. Uh, uh, three quarters of the state legislatures have to approve it. And that's both houses for those states that have uh, more than one house. And it was very difficult to get the uh, amendment that uh, allowed women's suffrage. In fact, it came down to like the, the uh, three quarters state, I think it was Tennessee, and there was uh, almost like a deadlock. And then um, it was like one vote of somebody that uh, was wavering, uh, and he was, I think, a Republican, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, his his mom said, well, you should vote for that, Sonny, and so he did. And that, that otherwise, we might not have women voting in this country. I mean, literally, this country is so ridiculous as far as uh, being progressive, but <laughs> we might not have even had women's suffrage. But luckily we do, and they can't take that back easily. Um, although the Republicans seem to be trying, they would like to not have women vote, apparently. Uh, it seems the way it's going. Um, but how to mitigate this problem with the decision? 
uh, an amendment would take so long to get through. Uh, it's certainly true that um, you could try to get rid of the corporate personhood, but because you're stuck with the Supreme Court that you have now, which is right-leaning, um, the only way you're going to get them to change their mind about it is to replace the uh, right-leaning Supreme Court justices with left-leaning ones, or at least the moderate ones. Um, for that, you need to always make sure you've had a Democratic president. So obviously, we have to re-elect uh, Obama. Uh, we have to also, hopefully, uh, at least with the demographics, uh, maybe be able to continue to elect Democratic presidents in the future, and maybe in 20 or 30 years, we'll be able to get the corporate personhood uh, dealt with. In order to deal with the Citizen United decision, uh, from a practical standpoint, I think what needs to be done is legislation which hopefully, if you can get rid of the filibuster and you can get Democratic um, members of Congress enough um, uh, majorities and um, somehow remove the filibuster, maybe you can remove the filibuster for sim certain legislation so that in the future it won't be a, a terrible uh, calamity to the country if the Republicans get a majority again in the Congress. Uh, this is what the Democrats are scared of. It's why they didn't um, follow through with the threats that they were made uh, at the beginning of this Congress or uh, in the lame duck session. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but there's some procedural way that they might have tried to remove the filibuster, but they, they didn't have the guts to do it because they were worried that the Republicans at some point in the future might have majorities and would be able to pass anything that they pleased. Now, you need to, you need to pass legislation for public financing, absolutely. And um, you also need to, uh, you, so you need to overwhelm the money that the corporations can give by public financing to say, if corporations give such and such, then we, the Congress, will give an all, that's the equivalent amount of money to the opposing candidates. So it's an even playing field. That's what you need. Uh, Mr. Sanders, thank you very much for your presentation. It was one of the best presentations this college and complex has had in a long time. And I'm really with you with all your new ideas. Makes my heart happy to have somebody with these ideas. Uh, big money is really dangerous for all of us. And a good example is recently. New York City, where they had term limits for the mayor. Billionaire Michael Bloomberg was able to eliminate the term limits. He's in there, still in there. So it's something to think about. And let's not forget way back in the 1930s when a U.S. Marine Corps general, in, co in coercion with uh, some rich folk, trying to steal the government from FDR. Mm -hmm. I'm Smedley Butler. Right, right. And he, and he stopped. <coughs> he stopped it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, you mentioned uh, McCarthy, and of course JFK. You mentioned him. Uh, have you read Chris Matthews' latest book on JFK? JFK and RFK, his brother, were pretty much in support of McCarthy. In fact, Robert was the only politician at McCarthy's funeral. <laughs> That's a little known fact. But, well, the Democrats would really hope you forget it when they uh, memorialize JFK, who I, of course, liked a lot. Being from Boston originally. Uh, That's being Irish. Irish. Yeah, right. More partly. Uh, you should feel sorry for the conservatives, I guess. Good. Why? Well, medical science and the studies of the human brain have found out that conservatives section and the section of the brain that sets off fear. Their, that section of their brain is more active than the average person. So there's a, the underlying problem. If we can get some medicine for these bastards, maybe we really straighten the country out. <laughs> Oh yeah, get on your computers if you haven't seen, if you don't watch Moyers and Company. He recently had uh, John Reed, who was head of the Travelers Group, was responsible for the mess of uh, getting rid of Glass-Steagall, 
when they put the travelers in the city bank. Uh, by all means, if you haven't seen that program, look it up and watch it. Because uh, Reed really tells you all about all the dirty work they did and how sorry he is that he did it. And uh, another Boyers and Company program had uh, none other than David Stockman, who was Ronald Reagan's budget director, a Republican. And you wouldn't believe it came out of his mouth. He told all, if you get a chance, look up the program and watch it. You'll really see how this country is so damn corrupt in many ways. I never was big on amendments to the Constitution, such as, oh, the burn of the flag was amendment the Constitution. But we really do have to do something since it's uh, Citizens United Mess. Oh yeah, we're talking about these countries in trouble like Greece. Uh, if you've read uh, The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein, a wonderful, wonderful book, uh, this is deja vu now. Look at the, uh, how uh, things went on down in Chile. They get in there, they privatize, they get rid of unions, they take over the country. Screw democracy. Uh, oh yeah, just before I left the house tonight, I was watching Channel 11, and Rick Steves, in line with what we're talking about tonight, warned about just a few people controlling all the TV stations. He said, that's dangerous, and it sure is. Uh, the Tea Party demagogues, they're always screaming about the high taxes. Are our taxes too high? Maybe so, and maybe not. But I'll tell you what the problem is. The prices are too damn high, and the wages are too damn low. Uh. Very better. Get what you pay for, Walter. <laughs> I think a case can be made that capitalism, capitalism as we have known it you know, through, through time, is actually death. I mean, you can look at the financial sector, you can look at insurance, you can look at all other energy sector, any of the major sectors that, that run our economy, they're all monopolies. And those monopolies have taken hold of our political system. So what, is, what does that mean in terms of, you know, um, exploring the terms of the debate? They have, they have uh, taken over the political process by, by really controlling the, the mode of communications, you know, through the, through the you know, corporate control of mass media, which has been documented by uh, by organizations like FAIR. So really the whole the whole system is corrupt to its core, you know, right now, and something needs to be done to address that. So as the speaker was mentioning, you know, one piece of legislation after another, we don't have to look any further than our own back door and the mess they made out of the parking meters, for God's sakes. That is a you know, um, you know, daily reminder as to what corporate greed has done done to our government. So, we we need to seize democracy, open up the terms of the debate, which has been stifled by corporate interests in, in this country, and 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 see what we can do to restore the democracy the way it was meant to be instead of the farce we have right now. My name is Wesley King, and um, I want to commend the speaker. Uh, I enjoy the enthusiasm and everything that she has. Um, location, location, location. To me, this is the location. Um, you can get a lot from here. There's been uh, the talk of starting something in a situation like this. Education, education, education. A lot of people need to be educated. Yeah. On, on many things. The educational system has been corrupted, or co-opted. Co the um, law library that was discussed. I've looked at some of these issues myself, and whenever you see me, my principal 
thing for a solution is there are two forms of dollars, okay? And there's um, Title 12, Section 411. This is something that I use. I don't pay any taxes. And, and it's because the um, one form of currency is based on the uh, corp, uh, Constitution. The other one is based on Federal Reserve notes. When you demand the um, corporate money, lawful money, the IRS will take your zip code and see if there's a bank in your area that you have an accounting in. If they see that you have Federal Reserve notes in that, then you pay taxes. If they cannot find any Federal Reserve notes, and I've been using this since 2007, <coughs> and they sent me a return for money on 2008, 2009, I got $2,100 um, December 7th, okay? They send me money back, okay? And I'm just letting you know I use uh, uh, in our 1040. Okay, that's what I found. The other point is we're occupied as a nation. The flag has a gold fringe around it. There's something that's called non de guerre, which means a war name. Whenever you have an issue with the government, there's something that's called a non statute abatement that you can use, which says, based on Roman law, if your name is in all capital letters, you are a slave. But if you say that you are a child of God <clears throat> and that you claim yourself, not that name that is in all capital letters, based on a non-statute abatement, which you can study at the law library, it takes away jurisdiction as far as traffic tickets and just about any issue that your name comes up in a court setting that is on all capital letters. You give that educational um, point to every citizen in America, along with the fact that you do not have to pay taxes based on that. You have taken the power away from the banks and the judicial system. Because when you walk in there, they give you your name in all capital letters and have you assign something that says you are a defendant. But when you use a non-statute abatement, you become the demander. And you can claim another thing, Jefferson wanted everybody to be educated in contract law. Because contract law can supersede the Constitution. So if you understand that everyone in America needs to understand that they're making contracts and trusts, and you say that you are the director and the beneficiary of your trust when you go into a court setting, you have the power for the nation to do what it needs to claim itself. Location, 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 education, education, education. This is the place. Well, I think we discovered who the next person is that's going to jail the college complex. <laughs> I was wondering who was going to be next to go. I'm trying to figure out which show we know now. You're, you're, you're on the list, buddy. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to read you, uh, I want to read you uh, what uh, Justice Scalia wrote. Uh, oh, 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 this is one of the paragraphs of the correct assessment. The, amend the amendment is written in terms of speech, not speakers. Its text offers no foothold for excluding any category of speakers from single individuals to partnerships of individuals to unincorporated associations of individuals to incorporated associations, associations of individuals. Indeed, to exclude or impede corporate speech is to muzzle the principal agents of the modern free economy. We should celebrate rather than condemn the addition of this speech to the public debate. So I'm totally 100% with Scalia. 
There's no, much, there's no such thing as too much. There's no such thing as too much free speech. Oh, no. this is a free speech forum. And if it, you know, I work, I work for a corporation, and there's and there's three of us there. And you know, we're three individuals, and if we, you know, wanted to fund uh, uh, somebody uh, to write a blog. Uh, and uh, endorse a certain candidate. You know, we should be able to do that. Yeah, you know, to pool our, you know, our money. Now, what gets me uh, about all this is that you know, unions are allowed to do this too. Unions can, can yeah. finance all this stuff. And here's the thing: you know, at least you know, corporations are free associations of people, where unions are not. Yes, they are. Uh, because people, you know, you know, unless you're from Indiana. But you know, like in Illinois, you know, a lot of states, you know, a lot of states, you know, you have to join the union. No, you don't. To get the job. No, you don't. It's not a right to work state. No, it's not a right. You know, it's Illinois. It's a fast share state. Illinois is. Indiana's you don't have to join the union. You have to pay a fee. Well, the thing is, there's people that you know join unions because they're coerced. They have to. No, they're not no. coerced. And uh, their their doom their dues money is being used to you know. Uh, support speech if they're not interested. Now, if you're if you're a uh, if, if you're a shareholder, you know you can you can sell your shares and not not support you know those companies. Now, uh, you know you don't believe in free speech. Now, there's another uh, along that kind of same line. Uh, this is uh, you know what the majority announced uh, the, the Supreme Court decision. The first again, this is about uh, speaker versus speech. First, the First Amendment does not tolerate prohibitions of speech based on the identity of the speaker. Because corporations are groups of individuals, the corporate form must receive the same free speech privileges as individual citizens. Likewise, the majority argued that the independent expenditures are a form of free speech and limiting, limiting a corporation's ability to spend money also limits its ability to speak. One of the main changes to First Amendment law announced by the majority was the expansion of corporate rights recognized by the court. So the thing is, and I mentioned this earlier, my, my first uh, comment or my first question this evening to the speaker. If Newt Gingrich had somebody backing him that spent a billion dollars making a movie about how great he was or maybe how horrible Obama was, it probably would not change your mind. And uh, if, you, if they spent 10 times that amount or 100 times that amount, it probably still wouldn't change your mind. The thing is, we still all have a, a mind, we have free will to decide who or who not to vote for. Now, there are legal limits on free speech. And those remain intact. For instance, you, know, you can't you know, fire in a, in a theater or things like that. But there's things, you know, in this Hillary movie, you know, if there, were, if there was some... Uh, you know, lies in there or whatever, some slander, she could sue the producers of that film. So I mean, the courts have already, you know, have a solution to this. There's, you know, there's laws about that. So I don't want to be restricted from what I'm able to see and hear uh, based on, you know, what some groups, other groups think. They, they don't, they're afraid what, you know, I might hear, so I can't hear it or see it or read it. Remember, and this applies to books and blogs and film, you know, uh, movies. And I'm wondering, uh, what about, uh, you know, the, the pulpit? You mean, what about live speech? I mean, you know, how, how long is it going to be before it extends to that? So anyway, uh, and I'm still I'm addressing a larger question. March 28th uh, at the Hyatt on 150 East Wacker, I think it is. 151. 151. Wacker and Water uh, water Place or something like that? South Water. South Water. The Ayn Rand Institute is having a free debate. Is government the problem or the solution with Yaron Brook? I think the, and I think we all know that government is the problem. Too big a government uh, is costing too much money. Here is, is largely <laughs> our problem. <laughs> I'm going to give, start my, my talk, my comments, with a paraphrased comment that I made a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, I, my comments concern our good friend and fellow student, Bob Matter, who I sometimes think would be happier if he lived in a world where Benjamin Harrison were still president of the United States. <laughs> Earlier, earlier this evening, comments were made about how original intent in the Constitution is important. Justice Holmes, who made that comment about, about uh, free speech and shouting fire in a crowded theater, also pointed out that the Constitution needs to be elastic, that the Constitution is an experiment, as all life is an experiment. And do we really want Republicans be spying on us as what happened when Richard Nixon was president. I'm old enough as some of the other people in the room to remember when John Kennedy was president and what a great era that was. His assassination remains to this day the most bitter disappointment of my life. Uh, with regard, however, to the comments that were made about the Supreme Court not having to review, had the authority to review elections, um, I don't know anywhere in the Constitution where it says that it doesn't. And that principle has been carried over to the Illinois State Courts, where, in fact, in 1964, uh, elections were held uh, based, one, on, an out, on, a, on a flawed redistricting plan for Congress, in which two areas were left out of redistricting altogether and had no representation, two, in which the Illinois Senate couldn't agree on how to redistrict, and as a result, they used the same districts that were based on the 1950 census. And three, that time we had cumulative voting. And you voted, you got three votes. Well, the Illinois House couldn't agree to redistrict either. And as a result, everyone in Illinois got 377 votes because they had to fill, every, each citizen had to vote to fill every seat in the Illinois House. They were confronted with a humongous orange long orange ballot. And the howls went up all the way to Springfield to the Illinois Supreme Court, which ordered everything redistricted. Uh, with regard to, yep, with regard to the business about um, how people don't pay their fair share of taxes. Well, when another Republican, Andrew Mellon, was Treasury Secretary under Herbert, Herbert Hoover, Andrew Mellon was the richest man in the country. Well. He had the Commissioner of Internal Revenue who worked for him, prepare a memo showing 15 different ways in which you could avoid paying any tax altogether. <laughs> Barry Goldwater was somebody I disagreed with, but I respected. He was a true conservative. As far as he was concerned, not only did the government uh, not have the authority to regulate your business, didn't have the right to tell you what to do in the bedroom or what, or what choices women should make either. I didn't always agree with Senator Goldwater for obvious reasons, but I liked him and I respected him. And he was not afraid to tell younger conservatives who disagreed with his compromises, look, I've been a good Republican and a good conservative all my life, and I don't need to vote A, B, C, or D down somebody's voting list in order to qualify. He was, he was building the Republican Party, for better or for worse, while well, a lot of these people were in diapers and not even born. And finally, the business came up about General Butler. General Butler, in fact, exposed that plot by the DuPonts, among others, to overthrow the U.S. government in the 1930s, and he brought it to the attention of a Senate committee, which investigated it and exposed it. Sadly, the DuPonts, who should have been sent to jail for treason, were not. DuPont is still carrying out chemicals today. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you mustn't go over either. <laughs> Time's up. <laughs> okay. Uh, group rights and individual rights. Uh, they shouldn't be set against each other. They they complement each other. Uh, but the question is, when you're an individual, 
and you have to face the boss as a worker, you're individualized unless you have a union, unless you have some solidarity with your fellow workers or uh, you know somebody the boss is afraid of, like his wife, uh, who uh, might have a nephew or niece uh, uh, or somebody uh, who he would hear about uh, and who uh, would be concerned. Uh, but generally, as a consumer or as a tenant, or as a borrower, or as a worker, you are an individual. And the, the boss, the landlord, the uh, uh, bank, uh, they're all corporate. And they, they, are individuals too, but there are individuals who have banded together in order to make a profit out of you. And uh, because they make a whole lot more money out of you than you make out of them, uh, they are going to have a whole lot louder a voice in Congress or the State Assembly or in the City Hall uh, and, the, with, and with the voters too because, you know, uh, PACs, uh, Public Action Committees and so on, they all have bigger voices than most individuals. Uh, you might band together in, oh, like AARP, uh, which, uh, you know, we are older, most of us here are older and uh, retired persons. Uh, but we, uh, we find that the AARP is largely uh, concerned with the, uh, the subsidies of insurance corporations uh, that uh, are uh, using the AARP uh, to generate business. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, we, what are we going to do? Uh, does the individual, we, we say, Every uh, woman should have a right to an abortion if she's pregnant. You know, she should. A poor woman. But why should she have to bear the burden of making that choice? Uh, the factors of, the, of those choices are social and economic and political. <coughs> Uh, and uh, 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 really, we all are factors in the choices that young women have to make. Uh, how are we going to make uh, the, the uh, electoral field uh, more equal? Well, uh, uh, a, uh, a reform might be that uh, the government give uh, some sort of uh, franking rights uh, for uh, distribution of uh, propaganda for the candidate uh, to each candidate. But my time has expired. All right, well, let's give a round of applause to our speaker once again. Very animated. I'll be eclectic as usual.
people are abuse my right of free speech here. Um, this is a topic that uh, is obviously various perspectives. Uh, or how do you approach it? I mean, you look at what I look at, but you do not see what I see. Uh, Bob over here likes to focus on the issue of free speech here, which he is singular and almost tunnel-like in his vision. Uh, no rights are exercised in absolute, certainly not the right to free speech. Uh, and whatever rights we have are not sort of absolute or exercised in a vacuum. They are defined by law. And the rights of speech have, in fact, been regulated. Um, part of this problem began by, I believe it was with the railroads, when it was decided that a corporate entity was not responsible, the, the individuals who made up the corporation were not individually responsible for the debts of the corporation. So that's a pretty good arrangement. <clears throat> So that individuals through collective enterprise can somehow be shielded or achieve some sort of immunity regarding their actions that normally would be prohibited. And I'll get into that, how we can prohibit actions in this regard. I'm sorry, your focus on this free speech is, is absolutely, and this is the free speech forum. We certainly, that's one of the things we stand for, and it's a little difficult for me to take a position opposite, but I am going to. <laughs> I've got no problem. Slip, and I also have a thing, if I had a little contradiction here in our speaker, and that she puts her collective action versus the collection, collective actions of another. Now there's a bit of a contradiction there, but no big deal. Uh, what are we really talking about here? We're talking about election, an election process. And the process is certainly something, elections are regulated. Not everybody can run for office, anybody can press. There's all sorts of regulations, I can assure you. As a member of the Independent Voters of Illinois, we know these quite well. You're disqualified, you're not found eligible, you have not met the criteria. Uh, disclosure things, oh, sundry laws, on and on and on. We certainly can regulate the election process, and I don't perceive why this has some immunity. I'm sorry, Bob. The, uh, if you use your own free market approach, which is you're always yapping about, we certainly can regulate, think of an election as a, as a free market enterprise. And we can, in fact, regulate commerce. We don't allow things, commercial people, to use children to make products and things of that nature. We, we regulate products which are unsafe or unsanitary. So we do, in fact, regulate this, if you want to think about it, as an exchange process, contributions, political things. Yes, you certainly can. Uh, regulated. I've got no problem whatsoever in doing that. Now, there's, uh, I'm going to, pretty much done with that, but I'm going to say, I've heard the speaker on one, twice say that she disavowed extremism, which all my life I've embraced extremism. <laughs> That's the only way you get anything done. What's this Buddhist middle path or something? Come on, go out there and attack the, the problem. You know, I mean, you have to show the emperor has no clothes. You know, come on, this kind of. Well, this is, you know, uh, no, get out there, and uh, that's the only way you'll, we bring about that uh, change and complication, which is sometimes called progress. I also want to say this thing, the other speaker spoke about that, this whole thing about the corporate entities, the thing we got to really watch out are these PPPs, public private. As she mentioned, the parking meters, public-private partnerships. And she's entirely correct. These guys are really looking to get over that. 
if they can take over the electoral process, they really got their eyes on the prize here. But last of all, I, I will say that, you know, the rights of free speech, because in my campaign for president of the college, I have no objection whatsoever with the support of the Lincoln restaurant in proving that my opponent is nothing but a shameless woman. <laughs> Kim for president. Yeah. No. Never mind. I better keep my mouth shut while I'm ahead. <laughs> keep my reputation intact. That's what they say, Charlie. Flattery will get you nowhere and everywhere. To be honest with you, I too have a, you know, I'm a diehard capitalist. I believe in free markets. But I also look at what a free market actually is. It's where people actually trust each other to do commerce. And if that trust is violated, that's when we start running into problems. I think some of the best examples of competition today are things like March Madness. What we see in the baseball games today. Every, they run a game, and the game has got referees, and it's regulated with a set of rules that everybody agrees to and adheres to. And boy, do we see some competitive games out there. Now, if you were to look at the Cubs and the Sox as a major corporation, the Cubs would by far be the winners as far as revenue is concerned per cost of expenditure. They have a dream of winning, which they never do, they have a fan base which comes out and says, we're going to pay these exorbitant prices for the dream. And it worked for quite a long time. But all of a sudden, their fan base or their customers demanded change. What did they do? They got a new CEO. And with it, a new management team. And within that set of rules and confines, they're hoping to bring some success that was replicated by the Boston Red Sox. I may be a little bit on the sports analogy, but I can see that if corporations were, in a sense, regulated the same way under the same playing rules, we would find ourselves a lot better off. And right now, with what I see in Wall Street, is a bunch of us an oligopoly which basically means they make up their own rules and they do their own things. It would be much like having the owners of the basketball game changing the rules of the game in midstream to cause the outcome of certain teams to be successful and certain teams to end. Now I think we all can agree that when a game is played fair, when a game is played well, we applaud the winners. But when a game is played by cheating, when a game is played via some fraudulent means, we do not like it. It's kind of funny because even Alexis de Tocqueville in his book, Travels in America, said, the one thing we must watch out for with these Americans is their rampant self-interest and greed taking over in one sector or another. Even in the book, The Road to Serfdom by Friedrich Hayek, he too acknowledges the role of government for some public goods, Welcome. saying for things like health care and fire and police protection should be part of that system. Am I for a capitalistic system? You betcha. It's been delivered the goods for 300 years to cause development. But what is it that we've exported in the last hundred years? <coughs> we have worker laws in this country that protect workers. We have <coughs> occupational safety standards that supposedly protect workers in a lot of cases. And yes, there still might be flaws, but the true travesty of the situation is we've exported what we cured a hundred years ago to places like China to places like other areas. Now, I will not say that, you know, they're not changing, but they are. 
They're going through the same process we did 100 years ago for worker safety and health. But why should they? The one thing that you don't have with a corporate contract is that Apple, for example, could come into any supplier and say, you must conform to these rules or else we don't buy from you. And if they don't, they can also then also be regulated into that same thing with the supplier contracts. There's a ton of ways to make the market trust. To, to sum up, it's a trustworthy system. It must have rules. And it must be regulated well with a minimum amount. But you must keep the fraud out of the system for it to work properly. You've got okay. 10 minutes to rebut speaker anything you want. Word. Speaker gets the last word. Okay. Uh, one of the comments, as I'm making little notes as all of you are speaking, or are so articulate, I am embarrassed to be part of this. Um, very impressive. Uh, there's a new case that I read about recently where uh, the government wants to um, find guilty or, uh, what's the word, say that's my bedtime. Um, go after individuals from foreign country, American individuals, if I get this right, you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, from foreign countries who have abused workers overseas, for example, a, an oil or gas company who has workers who have, have really mistreated employees there. When they come home, they can be sued and found guilty. And the question is, why can't the corporations who are now individuals be, be uh, sued as well for the yeah. same abuse? Yeah. And that's a question yeah. that's being, I'm not yeah. bringing this up. This is, this is, if they are individuals, then they have the right to be sued as well as free speech. So that's one thing. Uh, somebody mentioned Bill Moyer. One of, the, one of the heartbreaks for me was when Bill Moyer, when all this started, when Bill Moyer was removed from uh, PBS, because of the Bush appointed uh, FCC members, like like I said before, Kevin Martin and a whole bunch, they were spying on him, they were taping him, and they removed him. And this to me was now no longer free speech. I mean, this is a man who is, to, as he's flawless to me, I think he's incredible, now he's back on the air. But there was an FCC run by a particular administra administration who, uh, some of them are still on the board, and, and kicking off people like Moyer. Uh, with their fair and balance. That's another one of my pet peeves, is fair and balance. Uh, truth is not fair and balance. We're talking about that again. Truth is truth. There's not two sides to truth. And that's one of the things the media is doing. And you're on your log. Another thing that has upset me greatly, somebody mentioned Central or, or South America, I thought, in terms of something. Um, I don't know if you had heard this. I had read this in The Economist that in Central America, one of the countries down there, and this has to do with unions as well. Uh, teachers, it's one of those dictatorships that America is indirectly supporting. Uh, teachers and their unions are being uh, murdered, disappeared, and uh, tortured. Um, and the reason is being, and it's very similar to what's going on here, even though we're not quite doing the same tactic, tactics, is to rid the country of, of a public education system and having it just for the elite, and that's what I see happening in this country. Now, maybe not to the extreme. What country is that? It's one of the Central American com it, uh, countries. Uh, Honduras? One of them. I might be Honduras. Probably. And again, I'm tired. They just lost the government there about a year ago. Yeah, and well, it's one of the, and it's been quieted in the news, as you know, they're not talking about it anymore. But it's one of the governments that we, of course, back. Yeah, you know, it's like in the old days of, you know, Nicaragua and, and Sandinistas and all that stuff. Um, I did find this comment in my notes, but it's not a real citation, but I'll read to you about the Supreme Court. It says, um, the courts is called political question doctrine. The court's assertion of authority to overrule Congress on matters of financing elections violates long-standing limits on its jurisdi jurisdiction. The rule excluding the Supreme Court from deciding questions involving elections and other political questions was established at the same time as and limited the scope of the principle of judicial review. 
Uh, the Supreme, that for example, the Supreme Court's authority to have the last word on the Constitution and to overturn acts of Congress. The court has in recent years all but ignored this political question doctrine, resulting in the court's deliberate entrenchment of terminally corrupt political systems in places in place of constitutional democracy. Now they may, that may, may not answer the question, and I don't have a citation, but that's what I was referring to, that they don't have the, the right to, to uh, uh, decide on questions of elections. Uh, a couple other random things, and one of my pet peeves again in life is that if, on the right, those who want to take away a woman's right to choose and decide whether she should have a child or, or whether or not she should use contraceptives, contraceptives or whatever, it, it drives me crazy that no one still talks about the very obvious on the right contradiction. You don't. You want to get into that bedroom, you want to, or you want to decide a woman's right to choose. But the day that child's born, you're going to let that child and mother just found it for themselves. And that is one of my things. You know, uh, these self-righteous moral individuals who know what's right for the rest of us, but they don't want to pay for a strong public education or a Head Start program anymore. Um, the basis of it, government is too oh, too big. Government is not too big. Uh, if the corporations are not too big to pay taxes, then the government's not too big. Yeah. So um, that's my rebuttal yeah. on that one. Um, I do, you know, I don't, well, let me say that one of the things I've worked on in the last few years is, is uh, protesting the banks on Wall Street. And one of the best ideas we've had uh, and protested is the big banks is taking your money out of the big banks like Chase and starting the state banks. And you can do that, and some people have done that, some groups have done that, having state bank charters. Yeah. So the money is out of Wall Street. That's one thing. Um, let me see, there's a few other things. But the, you know, I'm a capitalist too, but I, and I, I think capitalism is a great system. But I do think there's a big difference between a fair market, a fair, you know, fair trade and free trade. And the free trade to me means nothing, it's buzzwords for mistreating uh, workers and fair trade is, is the opposite of that, so I would dispute that one. Uh, Scalia, um, I think Scalia all along had the intent of giving corporations more power no matter what his words are. Um, that, that's the only thing he cared about, he and Mitch McConnell and the whole bunch. And um, I, I think that's really, I want to wrap it up, I think it's been, it's, it's been a great night for me. You're, you're really an impressive group of speakers, much more than I am, and I, and I thank you all for letting me uh, even speak to you, and of course I said 8 o'clock is my bedtime, so I'm a little past that. Um, and I also was in a march all day for my son-in-law, and I'll be like Bill and Bill over, they've never seen a Democrat. Um, and I, think, I think it's probably true. Uh, that, that's about it. I, I do hope that even though I've been all over the place, and I apologize for that, that you will consider joining a, a branch of Move to Amend up to, for no other reason than to be active. And even though you, it, in, I'm in the middle, and I don't like extremism. I'm out there every single day on, on the streets for people in Waukegan and North Chicago and all over the place to say that we're all one family. And uh, we're all, if there's a God, and I don't know that there is or isn't, but we're all God's children, we have to treat each other all equally. Uh, unless we've done something to not deserve it. So. Um, to all my brothers and sisters who are of the same family, uh, I thank you very much, and it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you all. I hope that I'll see you soon. And, uh,